Hello, this is the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development. Uh, my name is Gordon McNeely. I'm the chair of this committee. Um, I just want to welcome uh, the, the members of this committee uh, today. Uh, we have uh, Sydney McEwen, Carla Bernard, Rob Henderson, Michelle Beaton, and Trish Altes is here. The exact bell will be joining us. And visiting member today is Lynn Lund. Thank you for coming today. Um, so we're going to get uh, a briefing on, on uh, various different subjects. Uh, today, so uh, I think what our guests might do is go through the whole presentation with questions at the end. If there's maybe we'll we'll see about any clarification. I'll take a few little clarification clarification questions during the during that if uh, any of the committee members need that. But we'll keep those particular questions or anything to a very minimum. Um, is that all right with our with our guests? Okay. Um, so we have the Department of Health today. Uh, we have uh, Minister Hudson, Mark Spadell, Deborah Bradley, uh, Lori Ellis joining us. And what I'll do is I'll pass it over to our guests um, to start the, the presentation, and then uh, and then uh, take your time. And uh, th those are the the rules as we see it. And we'll just uh, have a good discussion this morning. So thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you very much, Chair, and I do thank uh, the committee for inviting uh, myself and uh, Chair. You had uh, indicated uh, the other members or ones who are appearing uh, here today, and I would like to thank uh, my staff that uh, have came along with me. I uh, should mention Mark Spadell, my Deputy Minister, Deborah Bradley, the Assistant Deputy Minister, and Laurie Avis, who uh, is the Director of Workforce C Development. Excuse me, Mr. Mr. Hudson. Um, I forgot to ask for an adoption of the agenda. Is that okay? But Michelle Beaton, thanks. sorry about that. Great. Okay, thanks Great. again, Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, you look over the last uh, 15 months that we have come through, and I, uh, as Minister of Health and Wellness, certainly want to acknowledge the tremendous work that has been done by uh, CPHO in keeping Islanders safe, and also all of our frontline uh, staff for the work that they do for Islanders each and every day. So, want to uh, uh, give. Uh, my personal thanks to all of our health care workers. And again, uh, Chair, I certainly am pleased to speak to my colleagues here today, and also pleased to be able to follow up on the presentation that the CEO of Health PEI, Dr. Michael Gardam, recently made to the committee. Uh, Chair, I have been Minister of Health and Wellness for a relatively short time, but health and wellness have been important issues to me well before I even entered politics. For many years, I served as a member and also as a board chair of West Prince Health and advocated for health services in my community in Western PEI. My initial cabinet posting was, as you're all aware, as Minister of Social Development and Housing, but also helped inform my approach to health and would, uh, when you look at the social determinants of health, it's one of the things, too, that uh, we look, it's not just health and wellness department, it's right across government, but in particular social development and housing that plays such an important role in uh, addressing those social determinants of health and providing services to Islanders that are going to uh, uh, enhance those determinants of health for Islanders. And as I had mentioned there, Chair, uh, there certainly are many social determinants of health and well-being, poverty, housing, nutrition, a sense of belonging in the community. And health and wellness is very important. And there are extremely important matters. And I'll be honest, Chair, they are not without challenges. I want to recognize those challenges today and that we are working towards addressing them and solving those challenges. And I've said before that uh, where you see that these challenges, when you identify them, that there's opportunities that also present themselves at that time. Uh, with that, uh, too, Chair, I have to uh, uh, state, and we will get into uh, greater details, that there certainly have been successes over the last time period. Uh, as we uh, strive and continue to strive to provide Islanders with the best health care and to promote both mental and physical well-being, and which, in my opinion, uh, Chair, 
uh, these are two of the two components of wellness. These are multifaceted issues that require a multifaceted approach. We must be strategic, consider plans and services carefully before implementation of those plans and services. We must rely on the advice and on our health care professionals within our system, on partners in the community. And I can't overemphasize the importance right across government, but certainly within health and wellness, the importance of working together with those partners. I uh, also want to recognize the importance of the families right across the province of PEI and all individual islanders themselves as we move forward. They are the sources of expertise, when I say that, our uh, health care professionals, our partners, but we have to be there uh, to listen to islanders and to island families as well as we move forward. They have the sources of lived experience and people who can say what is working and what is not working. Today, myself and my staff want to provide you an update on where health and wellness stands in Prince Edward Island and on where we hope to improve and enhance these vital services and again to outline not only the challenges that we have to address as we move forward but also the successes that we have experienced and achieved to date, Chair. And with that, we'll move on to uh, the slide presentation. So. So just an overview of uh, the agenda of what we will be presenting today. First of all, an overview of the Department of Health and Wellness, a health workforce update, information and updates on patient medical homes and neighborhoods, information on dementia and the aging population, as well as an update on women and gender diverse islanders health strategy. And Chair, what encompasses our health? Well, as I'd mentioned before, certainly some of uh, the social determinants of health are uh, a major, have a major impact on our health. Uh, things such as access to clean water, healthy foods, the dollars, the income, the supports that must be available for islanders to be able to access healthy foods and also active transportation. The social connections, a sense of belonging to the community, good physical and mental health and well-being. We have to have accessible health services close to home, available when they are needed, equity of resources across the province, and that these resources, uh, when they are provided across the province, that they are of high quality and delivered safely. We're also health in all stages of life, childhood, adulthood, relationships, family, employment, retirement, and end of life care. Having appropriate housing, adequate income, economic participation, feeling safe within your home and feeling safe in your community. And again, uh, some of these ones, Chair, when you look at them, as I've mentioned before, it's not a matter of just working in a silo with health and wellness. It is a matter of working with our partners, but also across departmental lines. Uh, you look, and again, uh, uh, the determinants of health, but as well, feeling safe within your community, within your home, uh, so that involves other partners within other government departments as well. And Chair, my vision for Islanders, Islanders should experience a healthier lifestyle and live in a safe and active community. And I will strive to provide Islanders with access to health services from home or within their community. I'll belong to a medical home and medical neighborhood that will make it easier for me to navigate and access primary health care. 
I will have more options and control over my care as an individual. I'll visit the emergency room less often, and when I need to access it, I will wait for a shorter period of time. I will be hospitalized, if required, for shorter periods of time and will have the in-home supports necessary to recover well. I will experience less harm within the health system. I will age well at home, and I will have access to virtual care options to make it quicker and easier for me to receive the care I need, both within and outside of the province. And with that, Chair, I will uh, turn it over to Deputy Mark Spadell. Mark? Great. Thanks, Minister. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, certainly it's a great opportunity to talk about health. Um, so as the Minister said, we sort of lay out what our vision is for Islanders. What do we want Islanders to experience in terms of, of their health? And as he says, it's broader than just the health system. It's, it's, it's about how we live, it's how we work, it's how we play. And, and those are the components that we need to be focusing on from an apartment perspective. And as much as we deliver services, we also can lead and be partners in other areas that impact our health. Uh, so whether it's active transportation, and working with, with transportation infrastructure as an example. Those are the things that we need to be able to do as leaders in health and not necessarily always be the one that delivers it, but we certainly have a strong role and we want those roles to exist uh, within government and across government and, and within our communities. So supporting that vision that the Minister outlined, um, we want a system that meets as many needs as possible within our community. We want less reliance on, on, on hospitals and acute care. We want to be able to deliver our services within our communities, whether that's primary care, whether that's home care, and mobile care as well. How can we deliver more services to people in their homes, um, whether it's in, from a primary care perspective, from a mental health perspective, from a senior's perspective. We also want to have an integrated and collaborative system with seamless, user-friendly interfaces. And that's a real challenge, and we hear a lot about those pieces where individuals are forced to sort of navigate and so really what we want to be able to do is put that navigation behind behind the scenes and have, have the system navigate for people um, it's great to have navigators but at, at the end of the day we'd like to see more of that navigation happen uh, between providers and between systems and not not at the front uh, with with islanders our vision is having a large network of health services through strong partnerships uh, with community and other government departments and having been a deputy in, uh, and worked in, in social development housing uh, there's many NGOs, many community partners and there's, and there's great strength from that and as a health system I think we need to do more of that I, I see where, where we can be a bit closed and so we want to really open that up and, and grow our partnerships um, and, we're, and we're starting that strength we're starting to do that and we see the strengths of that and as, as individuals that you know, from a health perspective, it's not just a public system. We rely on our NGOs, rely on our uh, pharmacists, rely on others, and so we need to, we need to have them involved in the in that continuum of care. And so we really want to foster and grow new partnerships. As the minister talked about, the social determinants of health, and those those are really probably you know, quite meaningful to all of us, and and they really impact our health. Our health, um, and 99 percent of our time we spend our you know, we live, work, and play outside of the health system. And so how do we really support people where they live? And how do we really look at those as social determinants of health? How do we reduce the barriers to accessing health, whether, it, whether it's an income issue, whether it's a housing issue, and so on? Uh, we really do need to focus on that from an apartment perspective. We really do want to make a paradigm shift from bed-based care to community-based care. We have an over-reliance on, on hospitals. We have an over-reliance on long-term care. Uh, we know that individuals go into, into long-term care prematurely because it, perhaps there's a breakdown in community supports. And so what we really want to be able to do is put our investments uh, up front. And I know previous governments and previous administrations have, have attempted to do that, but there has to be a critical mass of investment um, before we can actually sort of <clears throat> be less reliant and turn off some of the tap to the acute care system. And so really what we're trying to do is, is really prevent um, people from being admitted. So how do we have teams that are in, a, in emergency departments that, that support people to go back home as opposed to being admitted and receiving care in the home, in the hospital? So we're really looking at how we can provide more services, more home care, uh, really long-term care at home. Those are the things that we want to be able to see um, and not have people being you know, inappropriately um, housed in, in, in institutions. 
innovation that improves health services, health service delivery, uh, increases health human resource capacity, and alternate options for accessing services. Innovation really is is a is a critical part moving forward. Uh, I think the pandemic has really highlighted that for us. We had to be innovative as we as we tackled the the, um, the pandemic, and that is really going to be from innovation that we that we see some of the. Um, are sort of our, our, our major challenges that we're going to overcome those major challenges through innovation and we are, well, I'll speak to that a bit later, but we are doing things uh, to address innovation here in the province in sort of a larger, on a larger scale. What are the sort of shorter term priorities? Um, for us right now, we'd say it's mental health and addictions, certainly primary care. Primary care is a big area as well and, and uh, talk just briefly about it, I think that, um, you know, it's one of those emerging issues that we're going to see in terms of uh, significant cost to our system. Um, it's, uh, you know, with, with new f sort of drug therapies, uh, we're seeing, which are, which are tremendous from a patient perspective, and, and we certainly we support that, uh, but it comes with quite a, quite a price tag. You know, drug therapy now can be $600,000 a year for an individual. It can be up to $2.5 million for some rare cancers. And so we really need to understand how are we going to, to be able to sustain that? How do we work with the federal, at the federal level to ensure that we have national uh, pharma care? But we do really need to look at this whole pharma care uh, piece in terms of what it means for us, but also what does it mean for islanders that um, have, have sort of don't have the insurance coverage? Uh, how can we sort of look at our... Um, our funding programs to, to be able to make it less sort of economic burden on, on individuals. Uh, so those are the things that we're, that we're sort of um, exploring now and looking at ways to improve. Clearly seniors care, that was highlighted through the pandemic as well and, and we certainly take that seriously um, and there's great work we'll talk about in this presentation today. Virtual care is, is certainly an emerging area. I think that um, we've really seen from Islanders that they've embraced this. This is a, um, a great tool to be able to access health care. It doesn't replace uh, in-person care, nor, nor would we suggest that it should, um, but it certainly has a place. It, it can allow a small jurisdiction like ours to be accessing care outside of the province, outside of our country. Um, you know, we could have a, an individual with a um, perhaps a, a rare type of mental health issue, and perhaps we could access a psychologist in the UK, for example. Uh, virtual care will allow us to do those types of things. So it, it increases our reach, um, as well as sort of timeliness and, and other aspects. But how we integrate it into your care plan, into your care team, is what we're really looking at. And so that's not a standalone, that it really becomes part of your circle of care. Certainly wellness is, is a, a priority. Um, we, there are elements within our department that we will be looking at in terms of wellness, but we'll also be then working with other departments and community organizations. How do we build a capacity within our communities to promote wellness? That's really, I think, where we're going to see a lot of that strength. Uh, again, we're not a service delivery organization or department, but how do we en enable community organizations, where we live, play, and work, uh, to really embrace wellness and, and embed that within their, um, within their programs? Health system capacity. We, we know that... Um, Globally, and we'll talk about this in a bit, globally we have major issues when it comes to um, our health human resource supply. And so how are we going to uh, overcome that? And there's, there's great work that we'll talk about that's, um, that's underway. Recruitment and retention, again, remains a, remains a top priority. Um, and we're, we're doing some unique things in recruitment and retention that we'll be pleased to, to share here this morning. Rural health uh, is important for us. I think it's about access to, to care in, in rural PEI. It's also about equity of services, of resources across the province. And how do we, lo it doesn't mean that everyone, it's equal that everyone gets the same type of service, not gonna have you know, tertiary care in, in, in rural PEI. But what are the, how do we take the resources that we have and make sure that they're equitably distributed across our, across our province? That really supports individuals to um, take care of their health, manage their health, and, and, and be healthy as they possibly can. And then our at-risk and vulnerable groups. We know there's, there's many of those, and they need to be dealt with differently. They don't necessarily fit into our traditional system. So how can we work with them differently so that they don't, um, you know, they don't run into sort of relationship issues with their health provider, uh, that they're able to access the, the programs and services that will benefit them. And, and so we're looking at ways that we can deal with those groups uh, differently. Some of our longer term priorities, and, and again, these, these are things that are starting now, but we expect we'll uh, see some, some, some gains sort of in the longer term, is around that digital care and that virtual care that I mentioned. 
uh, social determinants of health. And when we really look at the Centre for Mental Wellbeing, um, it really is about those social determinants of health. It's more that upstream piece that we're looking at. And so that's really what we need to put a stronger focus on, is that upstream uh, prevention, early intervention, promotion, and, and really affects everyone. Whether you feel you have a mental or physical ish illness, you can still benefit from, from those social focusing on those social determinants. Mental wellness, as I talked about, women's and children's health. Um, we have a we have a strategy that we'll, we'll be discussing, or the development of a strategy we'll be discussing here this morning. But there's certainly inequities within within um, health for women, and so we need to address that. And um, we we will be heading dealing with that head on. Our mental health campus, and I know there's been lots of talk about our mental health campus, uh, the need to replace Hillsborough Hospital. I think one thing that's really important to understand that as we're replacing our hospital, we're, it's not a for like service for like service. So, so we're not taking all of the people that are in Hillsborough Hospital today and they're going to be going into a new home. Most of the people that are in Hillsborough Hospital today will be going to transitional housing. They'll be going to the community. So people that don't need um, acute care, a mental health, they're going to be receiving services in a different way. We're trying to deinstitutionalize the people that are in, um, in Hillsborough Hospital, for example. So I know lots of times we think about it probably as a like-for-like -like replacement, but really this is about trying to put people elsewhere. And so as we roll out our mental health campus and develop that, you know, we'll be seeing um, transition home housing opening at the end of the year, potentially, and around the end of the year, January um, of next year. And so those, some of those individuals in Hillsborough Hospital will be moving there. We're looking at how we're working with social development housing, uh, people that are in Sherwood Home, for example, people that, are, that are, um, have been in, in, in the hospital for 10, 15, 20 years. How do we integrate them back into the community? How do they live with, with, with um, in supportive ways, but back in our community? We do that quite well with our intellectual disability and our physical disability individuals that require that supportive living, and we'll do the same for people with mental health. And so when we, at the end, at the end of the five years, when we have our, our new acute care facility, really it is an acute care service, and it's, it's meant to be short term. And you may have people that go in for, for part of the day, and we may, they may sleep at home, and they may come in for programming during the day. We may have people that are there for two or three weeks, but the intent is not that they stay there indefinitely. And that's why we're creating those other elements of the campus um, and within our community to support people with mental health um, in, a, in, a, in a better way talked about the need to strengthen partnerships um, and I think Islanders um, embrace that and they embrace our community partners so we need to work with them. We also need to look at introducing new health professionals in scope of practice. I think that um, you know we need to look at how can we um, introduce other types, it could be physician assistants for example, it can be um, mental health psychiatric um, nurses and we're looking at those things today. And so how do we bring other types of professions into, into our system to be able to increase the capacity that we need. And I'll talk a bit more about scope of practice um, as we go through the presentation. When we think of the landscape of healthcare and PEI, um, you know, clearly there's, there are lots of challenges as the minister addressed, and we, we hear a lot about the challenges, um, but there are a lot of, lot of strengths that we also need to be able to understand. I just want to put some context around that. Uh, the pandemic really has tested health systems in, in Canada. And we now have a better sense of where, where we have strengths and where, where our vulnerabilities are. And I'm not here to talk about sort of the impacts of the pandemic, but what we've really learned through the pandemic is that, you know, Islanders can embrace virtual care. They've demonstrated resiliency. Uh, innovation has really thrived here in our province. I mean, you probably can remember back when we were concerned about, you know, in the, the 3M, the N95 masks, and you know, were the states going to uh, prevent them from being shipped to Canada? We recognize some of those were the vulnerabilities, and so innovation really stepped up to address some of those things for us. We want to capitalize on We want that to grow and continue so that we're not in those situations uh, down the road. Vulnerabilities, as I mentioned, health human resources. We know that seniors care in Canada has uh, um, been devastating outcomes in, in other parts of, the, of, of Canada. Um, we had the benefit of, of, of being sort of, you know, we had low cases, obviously, but, but we, we were able to take those early learnings and apply them to our system, both the public and the private. We we've really gr have grown uh, a great partnership with our private uh, nursing home um, facilities, their operators, their, their staff. And so what we're doing there is, and we've also we've, we've put in resources to look at, and we did education and training around infection prevention control. We had um, outreach teams, out, outbreak teams that would be going if there was an outbreak, and we saw that happen at, 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 um, 
at, at the villa, at, at Whisperwood Villa, for example. And so we've, we have tested the system and, and the resources that we have, and, and we really feel that we've put in some strong safeguards to prevent uh, those types of, of care. That being said, we also know that social isolation was a challenge during that time, and we, we did put things in place to try to overcome that. But, um, but we recognize the vulnerabilities that are, that are there, and uh, we have more to do, and we, we, have a, we have a plan, and we have, we have investments already that we can uh, will demonstrate sort of our approach to how we overcome some of these vulnerabilities. As I talked about to over-reliance in bed-based care, we see a lot of people that are in uh, alternate level of care. They're being in the hospital when they don't need to be there. And so we, we're, we're looking at reducing that percentage so that there's less people relying and staying there for, for uh, shorter periods of time. And so that's really that home-based home care that we really want to want to improve and it's really providing sort of a long-term care services at home and um, there, there's many ways that we're going to many investments that we're putting in starting this year that will will um, sort of lead us down that path some of the other things that we've had whether it's before the pandemic or after the pandemic sort of after sort of the crisis of the pandemic um, our strengths are our community partners, and we've talked about that. It's about engagement with islanders as well. It, it's, it's great that we have the ability um, to hear from islanders. It, as a ministry in a small jurisdiction, you know, we do hear directly from, from patients. We hear from islanders. We hear about the challenges, the issues. We hear about where, where care is offered, which is, which is uh, where they're receiving good care. And so I think that we need to continue that engagement. We have our community health um, engagement committees. We're, we're sort of repurposing those, and we really want to be able to, to talk with islanders uh, in meaningful ways. We've also learned, too, that we can be nimble. We've learned that through the pandemic, and, and nimbleness is, is good when we need it, uh, and we need to be flexible and agile. We also have to think about what are the indirect, co in, indirect consequences of that, and we've learned a lot, that, a, a lot of, from the pandemic around that as well. But I think there is a need to be, to be nimble, and we've proven that we can do that. Again, our, uh, some of the vulnerabilities I talked about earlier, the high cost of drugs, uh, having a fully coordinated healthcare system. There's pockets where we're doing that, and now we're taking those learnings and trying to move them across the province and move them across programs and services. So some places it's quite smooth, and other places it's not yet. But we're taking those learnings and moving it forward. If we think of sort of even the skip the wait. We know it works well in, in family doctor's offices. We've now implemented it in diagnostic imaging and, and other areas where we're seeing a lot of missed appointments. We're, we've used it for our vaccines, uh, <coughs> excuse me, our vaccine appointments. And so we want to be able to take that those learnings and, and apply them where, where, where it makes sense and where it makes it easier for people to um, engage with the health system. So, so there are things that are underway, it's just a matter of getting the, the increasing sort of the reach of those, those initiatives. But those are things that are underway and, and what we still need to sort of uh, continue to invest in and, and promote. Other, so there are other contexts I think it's important to understand as well, um, whether it's our own health or the delivery of health care, we know that it's complex and that there's many systems that are involved, whether it's your own health, your own body in terms of the systems and how one can impact the other. Many times it's about the intricacies and the interactions and the connectedness of our health system um, that, that leads to sort of some... I wouldn't say challenges, but make, it makes the complexity of, of our planning and, and uh, execution um, so that we don't create other indirect um, outcomes as a result of, of, of new changes to our system. Healthcare, too, it spans across various organizations within and without the, with outside, the, outside the province. It's delivered by you know, a variety of health professionals. We have doctors, we have nurses, nurse practitioners, OOTs, we have uh, you know, techs. Goes, the list goes on and on. And so having all of them understand everyone's role and their scope, and that, too, can, can, uh, is challenging. So as we introduce midwives, for example, we have to understand how they, what their role is and how that works in, the, in, in connection with others. And so those are really important relationships that we need to be able to build and, and foster. Uh, medicine and healthcare are scientific. It's evidence-based and it's changing all of the time. And so we need to be able to keep up with that. We need to be able to make sure that we're embedding our, our science and, and our, our medical knowledge into the forefront of our, of our planning into our healthcare delivery. Uh, there are various governing organizations involving health professional regulations and service delivery. So we're dealing with colleges and associations, so, uh, and they self-regulate. And so there's many different players and many different um, governors that we're dealing with and involved in, in, in how we set up pro, uh, healthcare here in PEI. And of course, healthcare is expensive. Uh, no jurisdiction can, can afford it all. Um, and healthcare is ever 
evolving and growing rapidly and we'll show bits, we'll show where we've seen some significant growth uh, here recently in our province. So in terms of the Department of Health, I know there's lots of um, sort of, it's, it's confusing to understand the role between the Department of Health and Health PEI and other organizations. Really our department is to set the vision, the priorities, the strategic plans for the broader health system. And as the minister talked about, um, you know, whether it's active transportation, whether it's clean water, uh, whether it's, you know, restaurants meeting certain standards, that's really our job is to look at the broader piece, whether it's community pharmacy, whether it's ambulance services, it's your private OT, it's out of province services. All of those things are the things that we look at when we talk about the broader health system and the pandemic has really highlighted why we need to be seeing this as a as bigger than sort of just so sort of the Department of Health PEI Islanders including all of us access all of those services services that are beyond health PEI but they still are an integral part of our, our care um, so that's really our responsibility to oversee the broader health system uh, we really want to have a focus on health promotion throughout the lifespan, both physical and mental well-being. Our chief public health office, our center for mental well-being, will uh, will be, you know, certainly are, are probably our strong uh, areas within the department that focus on that. But again, it spans broader than uh, our department, and a lot of the service delivery happens outside um, of us. Focuses on workforce supply, regulation of professions, health, uh, private health sites, and monitoring health status and outcomes. So we, we provide regulation for health professionals. We license and, and inspect our private nursing homes, our community care facilities. Uh, we recognize that we need to be able to, we need to work with our learning institutions and we need to look, with, um, to, to look at how we can increase that, that supply as an example. We need to ensure our environmental health is clean and safe. Uh, establishing health, so we also determine sort of establishing what services we want to offer in the province. We fund those services and we create and foster partnerships. So it could be with Canadian Mental Health Association, it could be with our chances. We have a nurse practitioner uh, that's attached to one of the, to the chance program here in Charlottetown that works with um, newcomers and immigrants. And so um, we, again, we, we so sort of help to sort of fund and establish that and, and, and monitor that, that success um, and that program. It's about fostering a community. We really want to be citizen centric, and we really want to because we understand community centric. We understand that you know we want to look at what the citizens' needs are, but we also need to look at at how health impacts our communities. Whether it's even having hospitals from an economic perspective, whether it's having uh, and having employment for individuals, whether it's having access uh, closer to home. Those are the things that we, we that we sort of have to t to look at when we're looking at it when we when we set policy and, and strategy and direction here in the in the province. Ensuring that services uh, are meeting standards, standards and are delivered effectively and safely. We don't want hospital harm. We want to make sure that people in, in, in private nursing homes or people receiving uh, services from your community pharmacy are meeting those services and are delivered safely. Those are the roles of the, of the department. Some of the factors I think that, that impact program development, it's really about trying to balance the timely expectations with our resource capacity. It's about balancing it with our building relationships and the need to ensure again for quality and safety for our patients. And I think many times we wish that it was just a money or people issue that could solve the problem, but sometimes we just need the time to be able to uh, have, have programs um, because of the complexity, have them sort of have the gestation period so that they can they can be successful and not cause other indirect uh, consequences. So we know that developing relationships takes time to develop and foster. Many of the parts of the system are involved, may require retooling. Uh, it's about engagement with islanders. We know that's that's critical. Engaging with our frontline staff and professionals and their associations is critical. And collaborating with other provinces and the federal government, there's some of the work that we do is certainly is, is, is attached to the federal, federal mandate and federal regulations, and so we also have to be in alignment with those. And I'll perhaps I'll use midwifery again as, a, as an example. Um, it, we're really at a point where, where we do need the time to be able to see that um, implemented properly. So it's interesting when we first came into government, or the, um, the minister and his party came into government. It was, you know, top priority to put midwifery in, 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 in place. And so we started that. And, and from the department's perspective, we went to, to government. We had a mandate. We, had, we decided what the model was going to be. We got the funding from, for last year to start the, start the program. And as we started to, to unpack and understand what, what goes into midwifery, talking to the Canadian Association, talking to other provinces that have done that, they say it's really a three to five year 
plan. You, you, you can't execute something uh, of this nature with, you know, shorter than sort of a three-year piece. And there's provinces that have tried that and, have, and it's failed. And so from our perspective, from my perspective, you know, I've really asked the questions and have really, you know, dug in to see, are there other barriers in place? Is, is, do we need, is, you know, if we put 10 more people on it, could we get it any faster? And that's not the case. And so it really is making sure that, um, that the system is being retooled so that when mothers and their families, their husbands, um, their partners are able to um, deliver that baby at home if, if, there's a, if they run into an issue that the system is there to respond to it. How, what happens prenatally and postnatally that it's, that it's integrated and coordinated uh, with other parts of the service. And so, you know, that's what's, that's what's really critical to us. And, and I was on a, a call, an engagement call on, on uh, Monday or Tuesday this week, and the person from Newfoundland that we have is a as a coordinator, you know, she's very much saying this is a three to five years is a is a normal time for something like this. So I think we have to listen to the, to the science, understand that, and not rush something and and create some some in, indirect, perhaps catastrophic events that could happen if we didn't do this properly. So I feel comfortable now, knowing that as much as we wanted to get this up and running in a year, I feel comfortable now that you know this is really something that does need time, and it's not just something about it's not just more money and more people. So again, just to kind of highlight sort of the, the Department of Health, we're about division, policy, legislation, funding. Um, these are the areas that, that we focus on. Uh, service delivery really is about health PI, it's our pharmacies, it's our non-government organizations, community partners, ambulances, dentists, there's private providers that could be OTs, PTs, massage therapy, uh, list goes on, and our inter province services, um, to, to, name, to name a few. And so it's important to look that we, we oversee all of those um, elements of our, our healthcare system. And I just want to sort of highlight that it's bigger than, too, than just PEI, although Health PEI. Although Health PEI is a large, a large partner and a, a significant service delivery organization, as you can see, we have others that, that are there and that we also want to make sure are integrated into care. Oh, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Um, I know too. We, you know, it was brought up with with Dr. Gurdam about the the need for independence, and we recognize the need for health PEI to be to be independent, and, and with independence comes accountability, and so. Um, <clears throat> Until recently, we we, we we had no mechanism, formal mechanism, uh, to be able to um, create a framework, uh, an accountability um, agreement with with the authority. And so, uh, it's, it's drafted. We're ready to ready to sign it. Um, we'll be signed here probably in the next week or two. And really, within the framework, it helps to articulate the roles and the responsibilities. So, what is the role of of, of the department? What's the role of of um, health PEI, and it'll get even into into our initiatives. So, what is the role of the department in in um, could be in, in again midwifery for as an example? What's their what's the, what's our role and what's their role in that? So, it's clear that who's responsible for what. It's a bit. It's a two-way street, and this is not meant to penalize. This is meant to be uh, supportive in terms of working together and, and fostering a good relationship between the two organizations. It's about establishing priorities um, and we working with, with the authority, working with others to help us understand what those priorities need to be and, and what kind of expectations we can have around timelines. There's a, there'll be a section in there around communication and how do we communicate and when do we communicate. Many times it's when we communicate is what, what's, what's really critical so that we're not not brought into um, at the eleventh hour, realizing that there's a challenge of, of 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 executing a particular program. So we want that communication flow to be regular. We want it to be meaningful, and we also want it to be uh, earlier on. There'll also be there'll be a section there around issue management. So how do we how do we resolve disputes? How do we um, overcome some of the challenges? How can we support one another to be able to do that? And then clearly the, um, there'll be you know targets and benchmarks. We need to be able to set those targets um, and our benchmarks and 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 hold the hold the system to a certain level of performance. The department as well is responsible for a lot of strategies. Uh, these are these are some of our strategies um, that are that are currently active. Uh, there will be others in this. Um, but some of the ones to highlight are our suicide prevention strategy, our own Department of Health and Wellness strategic plan that really talks about um, the overall health system, uh, health and wellness for, for Islanders, our virtual care action plan, the Chief Public Health Office strategic plan, which would include wellness, seniors health services plan, 
our mental health and addictions uh, strategic plan. We have a pro primary care roadmap that we'll be speaking to here momentarily, and our seniors health and wellness action plan. I'm just going to stop. This is all right. Mike's going to get a drink. Just want to check in with the uh, um, the committee at at this time. Um, we're we're not we're we're not really we're talking about an overview. This is a great presentation, but we haven't really gotten into the four areas. Um, is, is the committee okay with proceeding, or do you want to dive into? I just want to check with everybody to make How sure. Much longer is it? We're, is Here's it, our first priority right now. We're done with the overview, so we're now moving into the four areas. So there's a breakdown in each of the four areas. Right? Exactly. Yeah. The presentation each of the four areas. Yeah. Okay. And so should we ask questions after each section? Yeah. May, maybe. Um, did um, Did you want to ask any quick questions now? On the, I just don't want to. Like that was. Uh, <coughs> Is it all right if we ask, get the committee to ask maybe one or two questions right now? Did, I guess my only sense was that the overview, uh, we already knew that, so it really wasn't, but, but say it's good to kill some time, but <laughs> anyway, I want to get into more of the, the meat of the matter, but if somebody might have a more specific question, that's up to each individual member. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'll let you continue. I just want to check in with the committee to make sure we're on our track. Good. All right, so we'll talk about the health workforce. Um, Really, the influencing factors around that are successful recruitment and retention, um, but that's really about you know trying to recruit the pool of people that are that that are available or that are that are um, health professionals in our country or globally. We need to look at our global supply issue and how do we overcome that. Uh, our workforce demographics and how our workforce is changing, and our growth and demand for health services has a significant impact on our need to recruit and retain additional health professionals. When we look at our national labor trends, this is across the across Canada, um, from 2019 to 2028. We know that overall, from what, what we predict in terms of our needs, we'll be short 44,000 family physicians and, and specialty physicians uh, in, in Canada. We know that in nursing, we're, we're going to be short uh, 46,000 RNs, LPNs, and NPs. And we know that we'll be short 9,200 social workers, OTs, RCWs, psychologists, and, and physiotherapists as examples. And so this really does highlight sort of the, um, you know, the stark um, challenge that we're faced here in Canada. Uh, now we, we, we certainly tap into global, global markets, global supply of, of health professionals, and that's been very successful and very rewarding. Um, just gives you a sense of what, what we're trying to deal with and, and that and why we need to look at um, our health human, health human resources. And so really as a department, uh, you know, in the last sort of 18 months or so, we've created our own division for workforce planning. We recognize the need to have focused um, energy and efforts and resources on this, on this particular issue and, and across all four of those domains. So we've implemented our, some of our recent accomplishments. We've implemented our Physicians Recruiting Physicians Program. We've increased our family medicine positions to 9.6, recognizing growth in population, um, growth in complexity of needs, demand for services, and uh, we've in increased um, funding for, for an additional 12 nurse practitioners across our system, not all in primary care, some of it seniors care uh, and other areas. We've increased new positions in nephrology, psychiatry, uh, of physiatry, uh, orthopedic surgeons, um, medical oncology, neonatology, urology, cardiology, and rheumatology. And we again recognizing whether it's wait lists or demand for services, aging populations, these are the things that we need to be doing to uh, be sort of proactive in the way we um, look at what our health needs will be for the system. We've hired um, 101 nurses to Health PI since January, so we're seeing a, a positive trend there. Um, we have 60 healthcare uh, students uh, working here, and again, that's a, a great recruitment tool. Uh, we've increased our, our incentives where, where we feel we needed to, and some examples are psychiatry, uh, anesthesiology, and nursing. We're working with education partners to increase both RN and LPN seats. Uh, locally, we also want to look at how we can uh, recruit um, students into nursing from other, other parts across the province and it has some equity across the province and also look at how do we uh, look at that sort of that fit test that I know uh, Barbara Brookins talked about. We are having, in conversations, we have been uh, with UPEI on this for a period of time now. So we see those are real strengths and benefits that, that could help from a recruitment and retention uh, perspective um, here in PEI. We've also introduced our registered nursing bridging, bridging program. We've seen our first graduates from that. I think we have 12 or 13 that entered our system here in the last uh, number of months. 
we're expanding that. We're now looking at, um, there's another stream that's coming up here shortly, or there's one that's underway, I should say, and we're gonna continue to do that. Our goal is really to look at, and, and the bridging program are people that are nurses from other countries, so they're internationally educated nurses uh, that perhaps need a bit of upgrading, or could be nurses that were, have been out of, the, out of the field for a period of time, perhaps they're, they're, uh, they left their, their registration or their license, um, Go and so they need they need to have a bridging program for, so for them to re-enter into the into the nursing profession, and so we really see this as a great opportunity if we can, um, and, and we know that there's there, that there's nurses in other countries that are willing to come here. So if we could get 20 or 30 nurses, you know, every year, this is a 13-month program. It's a it's a relatively quick way to um, train train individuals to become nurses, and so we really want to take advantage of this. We've had great partnership with uh, Skills PEI and and um, other other part other other departments within government and so we really want to we see this as a as a real opportunity to bring in and, and I think the benefit here is that these individuals when they come they we're having it so that they can work say as, as RCW as our home care assistants and so if they have sort of a year under the belt then they have their 13 month program get a two year return in service they'll be in that community and perhaps in that facility or in that program for sort of four or five year span and so hopefully the integration into, into society into our, into into our culture here in PEI will enable them to to stay and so we really think this is a great investment uh, a great approach to be able to uh, bring more nurses in a in a in a regular sort of yearly way to, um, to PEI. We're also working with their private nursing homes to address their health human resource needs. Uh, we recognize that it's not just about the public system. We need to have workforce uh, for all islanders, regardless of where they receive their, their, their uh, care. And so we're working with them directly now to see how we can support them um, in their recruitment and retention efforts. When we look at physician recruitment. Uh, excuse oh, me, Mark, yeah. we just have a quick clarification question. Mark, can you clarify when you say more than 101 RNs have been hired in health PI and the other numbers that you've given on here, are those nets or are those gross? And if they're gross numbers, can you give us the nets on them? So those would be the gross ones. So those are the people that have, have accepted new positions with us. So we are, I've asked for those numbers. I want to know how much, what, what our turnover is. Um, there's a net gain, clearly, at the end of the day. We're seeing our vacancies um, reducing, and, and um, but I don't have the number, Michelle, but we'll get that for you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, physician recruitment update, I think from, from, from our perspective, physician recruitment has been um, positive over the last couple of years. We really have changed our philosophy in terms of how we want to um, recruit and how we look at um, sort of growth and, and uh, turnover within the system. And so historically, when we looked at physician recruitment, it started when the physician retired. And so what we're saying now is we, we have some predictive analysis. We have reports looking across all of our specialties to understand the demographics of, of those, of those um, physicians, uh, when, if, some have been, and if they've already signal, signaled when they're going to retire, if we can predict when they're going to retire over the next five years. And we want to start recruiting now for that. And so you know, many times we talk about complement and, and that seemed, you know, historically has been a barrier. We're now, we're now sort of, um, we will be changing that, that approach, the complement uh, model, but we're working within that. And so, for example, if we know a physician in Montague is going to be retiring the next year or two and someone we're recruiting wants to work in Montague, then we'll go over complement to allow that, that transition. We want to be proactive. We don't want to say no to anybody until we've determined whether or not they're, they're, there's a need or a fit for them here. So we're not saying no to anyone. Um, we're also looking how we can support their partners, their, their spouses, in getting employment as well. And so just as an example, uh, just in, this, in the last month or two, there was an emergency physician that was moving to, wanted to move back to the province. Uh, his, his wife was a, a medical technician. There wasn't a position for her at the QEH, but we were able to create that so that he could come, and, and that they're now both coming back to PEI. And so we need to be flexible and nimble, and we need to look for other solutions, look at the whole family uh, dynamic of those individuals, and how do we support that? Um, and how do we use that sort of to support, you know, the overall benefit of, of, of PEI in our health system? So we're being very proactive um, and being trying to be flexible and nimble and, and very responsive to um, the people that, that, that come to us. Right now, we're 
currently uh, active recruiting for 15 phys uh, family physicians. We had 5.4 vacancies. We just added the 9.6. Of that, we have 10, 10 individuals that have uh, expressed interest in those positions. Um, we have six specialty physicians that uh, positions open, and we have active leads for all of those. And there's four emergency medicine um, vacant positions, and we have some leads in those areas as well. So collectively, right now, we're working, we have 40 leads. Uh, and, and, and on top of that, we've had um, uh, 24 new hires that started in 2021. Uh, we had two hires that are this year that are going to begin next year, and we have 17 active offers. So those are those are people that are in the process that have have agreed they're going to take the position, just haven't signed their contract yet, and don't have a start date. But those 17 will now become into the will be added to the 24 hires once those all get finalized. Um, so, for example, the two general surgeons in, in, in um, Prince County, um, they've accepted the letters of offer, they've signed that, so we're in the contract stage with them right now. So that 17 will go to 15 and the 24 will go to 26. Um, so there's all of those 17 are committed, just haven't finalized contracts and haven't um, start, have a start date yet. So increasing our workforce capacity, I think, is critical, and, and, and we want to do that in a, in a planned, uh, strategic way. Um, we recognize that, that again, there's, because professions overlap and they connect with one another, we need to look at it as sort of a, a broad fabric of, of our health professionals. And we really want to put a clinical services plan. Many times we had a nursing strategy, we had a physician strategy, a um, psychologist strategy. And what we, really, we were saying is we need to look at all of those because um, they're interconnected with one another. And so that's some of the work that Lori and her team are, are uh, starting with. And we're working with uh, Dr. Peachy, um, we're having conversations with him, who's done this work in other provinces, such as Manitoba. And um, so we're quite excited about what he can bring for us to really look at that uh, broader capacity report. Uh, we we'll continue to work with, with government, education, working with UPEI, we're working with um, our different colleges and, and learning institutions here in the province and outside the province uh, to look at how we can um, increase that, that, that supply. Scope of practice is something that, that's talked about frequently and, and I think it's really um, strong potential for us to really tap into increasing capacity in our system. And I think we really need to explore where there could be new professions, and as I mentioned before, it could be the, the, the physician assistants, um, and how do we use them, and how, do that, how does that get integrated into our, into our system that, again, helps to reduce or increase our capacity and reduce wait times and those types of things. But it has to provide value to islanders into the system, because we don't want to create more silos. So if we use pharmacy, for example, there's wonderful things that they can do. And we've started, for example, with UTI. When we looked at our data for UTIs, the number of people that went to immersed departments or to walk-in clinics, really we could say that there would be great value in having that service offered in community pharmacies. It's offered seven days a week. It's something that needs to be taken care of you know, urgently. Um, and so we saw the real benefit of that. So we've worked with, with the pharmacy association, with the college uh, that registers pharmacy, pharmacists, and we were able to provide the funding and get that mechanism in place to do that. Now, there's other things that they may or may be able, may, that they're able to do, but perhaps it's not necessarily a big need for us. And so we want to be putting our investments where there's needs, and we want to be able to make sure that that gets integrated, integrated into the care. So if, if a woman goes to a pharmacy for a UTI, we want to make sure that that report is back to their family doctor, for example, or that there's follow-up needed, that the follow-up is being done properly, and that that information is going into your chart. So we, we need to make sure that it gets integrated into your existing care uh, pathways. Uh, another piece around the workforce is, is the role of the Public Service Commission. I know there's been conversations around that in the last week as well, uh, or this week. Um, <clears throat> really, it's, it's Health PI and, the, and our recruitment team that, that, that looks at sort of the, the overall components of, of um, recruitment um, and staffing. They're really they are there to, to um, help support the, the interview process, the posting. Uh, I spoke with um, the CEO from, from the Public Service Commission yesterday, you know, the, and she shared with Dr. Garrett and myself that really it's a, a one or two day, once they get, get word to post a position, it takes one to two days to get the posting up. I think where some of the challenges are are, are more around the classification. It's a cumbersome process. Um, there's a, a system, the Willis system that they that they use, and so that that can slow down processes, especially when we go through perhaps developing new programs or significant new investments. So if we have 30 positions we need to, to reclassify for primary care because we're investing in that, that that takes time, and so. Um, 
normally I think the normal turnaround time is, is reasonable. It's, it's more when we have sort of, you know, um, ebbs and flows within our work, within our, our, our demands that, that causes some, some, some um, perhaps some expected delays within, within their work. So moving into the patient medical homes in our neighborhoods, um, as it, oh, go ahead, yeah. Uh, we just might stop right sure. there for, and just ask a series of questions, is that okay? So um, is, is that okay with everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, just because um, I want to make sure. So um, <clears throat> the list, I've got Rob, Michelle, Sydney, Carla, Trish, and then Lynn, we had talked, so that's the order, so we'll, is that okay? We'll just, uh, Rob? So we're just going to ask questions on the workforce. Right? Yeah. Okay. Just okay. try to keep your questions short, and maybe the answer short. So you, you did you did allude that you met the other day with uh, with uh, the Public Service Commission Tanya Rowell or what the exact name but pronunciation. But anyway, uh, recently certainly Dr. Garda mentioned the comment uh, that uh, he feels that the, the Public Service Commission is a is a major problem in, in its abilities to uh, to. Uh, fill these positions. I think the union of the nurses also was very critical of that hiring practice. Certainly my sources are telling me the issue is, is uh, quite extensive and it seems to be more around the issues of uh, human resources within the Public Service Commission. Uh, what I'm hearing is that there's uh, long delays in uh, staffing to, to do those positions, so do, even to do the interviews. There's only, only one person I think in Prince County from the Public Service Commission kind of assigned to this stuff. and. Uh, Interviews take a long time to get because you can't get because people are working in their positions, so they, that's a, that's a, another delay. So you said you just you met. So minister, have you had a good conversation with your counterpart, minister, minister Compton, on this subject? And uh, you just met with them yet a few days ago. Is what? Uh, how many times have you met with them on this particular issue? Uh, thank you, uh, member, for uh, for question. I think uh, one of the things, and it is uh, like, I'm not here to sugarcoat anything. Uh, it's one of the things that in conversations uh, that I've had with, uh, certainly with uh, the CEO of Health PEI, and I think it goes back to one of the things too that was brought forward is with regard to communications. Uh, on a regular basis, the chair of Health PEI, uh, CEO, my deputy and myself meet uh, and it's a very frank discussion, I'll be honest, with regard to some of the challenges that we do have. Uh, has there in the past been uh, uh, delays, longer delays in uh, going through the hiring process? Yes, I would agree with that. There have been additional resources that have been uh, provided by government to uh, the PSC uh, for enhance, I shouldn't say enhancing, but for uh, allowing PSC to work specifically on applications, postings for health and health PEI to, uh, you know, to uh, move this along more expediously. I don't know what the... Uh... Yeah, I can add to that. Um, so we've been working with the Public Service Commission for a number of months now. So last November we had a Health Human Resource Summit. We had Health PEI there, we had the Public Service Commission there, we had Skills PEI there, uh, the department was there uh, to start to talk about how do we look at recruitment, how do we look at the hiring processes, all of those things. And so we've had, we've had many cons conversations. Probably two or three months ago, maybe two months ago now, we've, we've committed additional funding to the to, to, um, Public Service Commission uh, to help us with some of these hard to recruit positions. Uh, they'll be hiring another staffing officer, another classification officer, uh, administrative support to really help um, uh, move through in a more more timely way. Um, so we feel that that's that's going to be a, a significant improvement in terms of of our turnaround times. Um, we're going to be having the admin support is going to be reaching out to anyone that applies for health positions. Uh, there'll be a, a reach out immediately to them to understand you know what are their interests. So if it's a nurse that wants to come here and apply for a particular position, are there other interests that they have? What about their spouse? What about their ch family situation? Are there other things we can do to connect them to try to attract them? So we have been making some, some gains and some, some, some changes. So that's why yesterday it was just more of a check and say, okay, what's, what's happening here? What's the perspective? What are some of, and some of the examples that we received, we were able to sort of unpack and say, you know, this is not necessarily a public service commission issue. And so I think it's, again, we work in good partnership. They've been, they've been tremendous to work with. Um, and again, we're putting the resources there so that we can see the outcomes. 
Mr. Uh, just a quick comment, if I could, Chair. I think that we do have to, uh, as we move forward, we have to be a bit more flexible. And just as an example, like if you have a facility that has uh, vacancies, that has openings, but these are, uh, you know, 50, 60, 80 percent positions, but we have an individual coming in, a qualified individual that's interested in full-time employment. We can't say, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have any full-time positions. We have to have that flexibility to bring those human resources in. So I'll leave it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Um, well, Mr. Uh, thanks. So it's encouraging that you are going to provide the resources to the Public Service Commission, because I think that's where I hear a lot of the, the gaps are just not enough staffing at the Public Service Commission to do the staffing for the health PEI. And since uh, the chair is ruling with an iron fist, I only get two questions. Uh, the other one is a, is a comment that Dr. Garda made, and it has to do a little bit with your presentation here around uh, doctors and trying to recruit them to different positions. Uh, Garda had mentioned he would like to see an open system. Uh, where uh, doctors can go wherever they basically want to go and practice in Prince Edward Isle. Now, Minister, you're from a, a region, a western region, that uh, uh, sometimes will always have that struggle at times to uh, attract physicians to rural communities and things of that nature. Are you planning on doing away with uh, billing numbers assigned to regions, or are you going to open it up to uh, be a completely open system? Well, uh, you're absolutely right. We're both uh, from the western part of the province, and uh, as uh, previous uh, chair of health uh, for uh, the West Prince Health Board, uh, as I said in my opening comments, uh, certainly completely committed to uh, health care for Islanders right across the board, and it's been put forward here as well, the importance of providing those services as close to home as possible. Now, is that always going to be available? Um, uh, no, it's not. It's one of the things that uh, Deputy Mark has alluded to that we have learned, if you like, and been able to uh, develop as a result of uh, the pandemic is virtual care. But uh, back directly to your question, I think you look at the additional 9.6 uh, full-time equivalent family doctors that have been added, those positions have been posted. And I believe as we move forward uh, through the, the presentation here that it will show where the allocation with regard to geographic region of those additional 9.6 uh, will be uh, incorporated in. Uh, I'm a strong proponent of right across the province, whether it's West Prince, whether it's Surrey, whether it's any area of Kings County, whether it's any area of rural Queens County, that, uh, yeah, those services they need as much as possible to be provided as close to home as possible. And I think the next section that uh, Deputy Mark will be leading into with regard to uh, medical homes and medical neighborhoods will uh, provide maybe a bit more clarity on that as well. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think um this is not an all or nothing thing. So the compliment doesn't work, not having a compliment doesn't work. And so I think when we look at where, where's the friction within that, what are the challenges is that there's a bit of a cap. We certainly need to have so many physicians in West Prince and in Kings and in Charlottetown. We can't have everybody just working in Charlottetown or in Summerside. So we don't want to lose that. We want to make sure that there's good allocation of resources. But to say you can't have more than 10 when maybe you need 12, um, people want to work part-time, full-time, that's where we need the flexibility. So we're saying, let's let's change it so that we can be flexible in terms of, let's be proactive. We have someone that wants to come back to, to Montague and, and set up a family practice, knowing that someone's gonna retire in the next year or two. Let's invest in them now, go over the, co the cap number for Montague and allow that to happen. Where right now they're saying, we have a cap and we, historically they're saying we had a cap and we can't work within that. So it's not about sort of just giving a free for all, but it's really about allowing some flexibility regionally. So the current core of uh, billing numbers assigned to regions same. will stay the same. Yeah, right. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? Great to be here. Um, so I had asked some questions around were those net numbers, and they, are, they aren't. And given that the topic is recruitment and retention, to be honest, I'm surprised that you're not coming with retention numbers as well, right? To have, give us two columns so that we actually see what the picture is. That's fair. Like, that was what our ask was, and we didn't get that. So. I would really appreciate getting those numbers, but what I'd also like to see, and I'm assuming that you track this, is what does it look like year over year? Because is 2021, 2020, 2019 worse than it has been? And if so, you've got problems within the system, and what are you doing to fix it? 
And if you don't have access to retention numbers, you can't fix anything, right? So that, I just want to point out that it would have been really, that was my expectation coming out in, that the retention numbers would have been here as well, because that was what the ask was. So I want to go to scope of practice. And you had talked about pharmacies, for instance, and, and we can talk about OTs, physiotherapists, we can talk about the whole, all of the professions. And you had, a, you had said, well, that might not be what our need is. I'm going to tell you, the need for urinary tract infection services within a pharmacy should have been identified well before it was, and it was, and it was advocated for, and it wasn't heard. The need for um, birth control. It's been advocated. We know there's a lot of things out there that these professionals can do, but there's a roadblock that's been set up um, that is not looking at scope of practice and allowing that wholesome discussion to happen between all of those professionals. Can you tell me what you're doing to have those discussions now to see how you can fill up some of these, fill some of these gaps? Because we know we're not doing it through recruitment and retention is hurting us. So how can we do it with who we have? In under 60 seconds. Well, that's my one question, so I would love to the, okay. have the answer. Okay, perfect, yeah. No, thanks, Michelle. I think that um, so when we when we sort of when it came in two years ago, we recognized you know pharmacy had identified there was a number of areas that um, they could increase their scope and provide value to islanders, and so that's when we recognized immediately. Yes, UTI was on there. We had um, birth control on there. There's a couple of others that were on there as well, and so we set up a committee, and Lori leads that committee. It's with with the pharmacy association. It's with the college because they're the ones that have to determine the the scope. Uh, aspect of that and so when we looked at the data it was evident that yes of course we need to have UTIs and so you know we went through the proper process there was legislative changes other regulations and things so we did due diligence and we got that up and running um, when we talk about um, birth control uh, so we, we've, we've had great conversations about that internally and so um, oral contraception is not the first is no longer the first line of treatment and so what what clinicians are telling us uh, collectively that there doesn't mean that we wouldn't have we'll have to have some and I, I advocate that we have to have some we need a better access for for um, birth control for women clearly but the concern is then making sure that they have they need a path that it gets done that they get the education that they need if there's family history of concerns around um, oral, con you know, blood clots and things like that. So we need to make sure that we're not just doing it in isolation. Um, so we may get there or we may look at other ways that we in increase birth control for women. Um, but we've had those conversations and it's just, it's not a clear, we should just out automatically do it. There's other, other um, clinical interventions that need to take place along with that. But we're open to those. Those are the kinds of conversations we're having. We're having the right professionals in the rooms having those conversations and we really want to rely on their expertise so that we can but, it, but at the end of the day, there still is an inequity for women on that, and so how do we address that so that, that they have easy access to birth control, whether it's through pharmacy or through another, act, another mechanism, we still want to be able to address that issue. Not a question of yeah, comment sure. in 30 seconds. Um, but what we're hearing is, is people aren't at the table when those decisions are being made. So how, like, how can you make those decisions on behalf of those professionals, whether it's occupational therapists, physiotherapists, when a decision comes to them which is already the program's designed you need to have them upstream so and i'll be honest i'm hearing that from many other many areas where the decisions and the programs are coming already made without having the consultation with the professionals that can actually help support it so that's i think that you need to look upstream of how you're doing your work not bringing them the program and saying how are you going to fit this into you, what we're going to allow you to do so not really a question mark, I'm just saying like that I think is where a big problem that we're hearing from some of the unions and the professionals in those areas are and that that's how they're feeling. If you don't respect their feelings and include them in the decision making process, then it's impossible to make them happy. Okay, to uh, yeah, just comment on the comment. Uh, yes, uh, just on uh, on uh, the member's uh, comment or statement, I, as minister, would certainly appreciate you said uh, numerous uh, fee amounts or contacts that you have received, uh, and we don't have time here, but I would appreciate if you could supply that information to me. Sydney? Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you so much for uh, coming in and providing uh, the presentation. Um, 
Uh, Mark, you had said uh, uh, in regards to the Public Service Commission uh, in your meeting, typically one to two days you can get things posted, and, and uh, I'll echo uh, Robbie's comments. Um, it's not just in health you hear it. That's where the delays begin, right? Then it's okay, it's posted, but then the follow-up, the interviews, all, all that kind of thing. Um, you've no doubt watched the last couple of presentations that we've had from the committee. Is uh, d Does the Department of Health see advantages uh, in health PEI taking over uh, the hiring process for health professionals in PEI? Um, my short answer would be no. I think that um, when we really look at what the challenges are and what the issues are, I don't think it's the structure that's the problem. And so certainly we need more resources, which we're putting in there, so that will be one improvement. Um, there's also a difference between sort of you know our temporary postings and our permanent postings, and we certainly have more temporary than we do a permanent, just because of churn in the system. Um, Excuse me, a lot of that can is still is still within the responsibility of the authority to do that within Health PI. Excuse me, to do that. Um, and when we look at really, you know, and even having spoken with Dr. Gardam again this week about it, he's saying it's not the staffing side that's the, really the problem. For him, it's more on the classification side. And so, because we really, what really wanted to unpack, what is he trying to, what is he observing that we can learn from, so that we can, you know, make sure that we're fixing the problem and understanding the problem so that we can fix it properly. Um, and when I said earlier, a lot of times it's the intricacies and the nuances that really make a difference. And so um, we need to fix those if we're really going to fix the problem. So I don't, the short answer would be no, I don't think we need to. There's other areas that we need to tighten up and fix um, for us to be able to make that a more timely, a timely process. Sydney? Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I don't know if it's a fair assessment or not, like, you know, the Public Service Commission filling all kinds of other department roles, you know, you're backfilling project officer, you're doing all that. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's a fair comment for me to say, but, like, you know, is there, you know, I feel like there's more pressing, not like, more pressing, like, needs in health timeline-wise. And I, I think of the mobile health, uh, mobile crisis teams, right? And, and, you know, I know that it is what it is. It was taking a while to get going, but you know, they have people hired and then they've got to go do other things. And so our hiring process for that needs to be nimble and quick so that if we, if you have a date to set this out, we've got to push that. Do you see a method, though, to be able to push priorities with the Public Service Commission that perhaps Health BEI or the Department of Health could, could make they go faster? And I know you said, no, you don't see any advantages to the system. It, it, it's more with the classification. But do you understand what I mean? Like in those timely situations, how do we make it happen so that that's not the delay in this example for a mobile crisis team role in it? I think that part of the challenge, um, so in that example, is that there's a lot of HR sort of bureaucracy that I think we need to streamline, and that that lives within health PI. That lives in most HR com or uh, departments within organizations. I'm not being critical of health PI, but I'm saying is that. You know, the, I think we can tighten that up, and when we really look at where the delays are, so when a when the decision is to post a position and it has to go to finance, has to go to HR, it has to go through many layers before it gets approved to be posted at, print, at, at the um, Public Service Commission, which gets up in a day. Like that's not where the problem is. The problem is in all of the layers within within the bureaucracy of, of health PEI that we need to try to realign and, and reshape. Other things that we can be doing too. So for example, you know, every year we hire 60 new, 70 new graduate nurses. And the only time we don't hire them is based on a reference. So we're saying, well, okay, let's let's cut out the whole interview process component, that that time lag, and, and jump right to references. And if all of those are, are, are positive, let's introduce them. There's still always a probationary period and all of those things that applies to anybody. So there's other things we can do to sort of cut out the bureaucracy and make the process easier. So it's not about who owns it and who does it. It's making sure that your processes are not too bureaucratic. Are you not Yes that's, that's what we're, yes, that's what we're saying for them to do is to do it that way, yeah. Thanks, Cindy. Carla? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't even know where to start. I have uh, so many questions. I guess um, a concern that I'm having is the vision that you've presented, your words, tell a very different story from, from what we're hearing. And that's concerning. Um, I'd like to make a clarification that could probably wait until the women's health sex strategy, but I need to say it now. Birth control is not a treatment. Um, it's not for women only. And when we're making decisions such as that, are there people who use birth control at the table? I'm guessing that answer is no. 
um, this needs to be, we need to help people make informed choices. And I'm hearing stories about women whose husbands have gotten in for vasectomies before they got their IUD. Women who have had IUDs in for seven years and had to have them cut out because they're only supposed to be in there for five. And so, you know, those are just, these are just really small examples. Midwifery, of course it takes three to five years to implement. Of course it does. Rather than making announcements that it's coming, we should have known that from the start and been honest with Islanders right from the start. I'm a bit, <laughs> a bit frustrated about that. Okay, so my questions. Um, I'm wondering with retention. So recruitment is one thing and retention is where we really struggle. And we're hearing horror stories every day in the media. We're hearing from, from healthcare professionals who are not being consulted in the media. We shouldn't have to email you, Minister, with all due respect. You should know this. We know this just from reading the newspaper and from people who reach out to us. I'm sure they're reaching out to you as well. Um, what are we doing differently with retention? Yeah, no, it's a really, really important piece, and that's that's where we know we need to put, you know, more focus on. And so, when we look at the survey results from Health PI, we re we we recognize that there there are challenges there, and we're not sugarcoating them. We're not, and we're having those conversations. Um, we need to look at how we change the culture, and I think really what Dr. Gardam is is trying to do, and and is aligned with us in our in our feeling thinking around how do we change that culture, and how do we create. Uh, work environments that are that are um, more welcoming and, and more supportive of of workers. I think that that's um, unfortunately has gotten missed. And I think you know we've we've looked at the examples of of people that wanted to go work at say Veterans Affairs and you know not being denied their their uh, leave of absence so forced to resign. Well, that's not the approach that we want people to be taking. We need to change that. We need to support our employees different, show the value in different ways. And uh, many times it comes down to how they feel valued. And I think that's really what we're saying to Health PEI and saying to, to Dr. Gardner, and Michael, and Dr. Gardner believes this and his, his executive team believe this, that we have to change that. And that's that's a culture that's been there in pl place for a period of time and we, you know, we want to support them to be successful in doing that. And so we're looking at, um, even say well, physicians, for example, look at the lifespan of physicians. How do we look at training and education? How do we support them in different ways? sort of end of career, how can they start to perhaps have a, um, a smaller practice but still maintain practice? How do we support people that want to go into leadership roles so that they're not adding it on to their complement? So they're not working full time as a doctor plus point four as a, as a leader. How can they do all of that within one and recruit more people and not be tied to this complement? So we're looking at all of those ways to really support um, uh, staff in a different way and and it's I think it's culture and mindset and and we see where you know in healthy organizations when you have a healthy culture uh, you have you know higher satisfied uh, employees and so we really want to um, address that we need to address the shortage of staff. We know having not having enough staff is a is a, a real problem, and so there really has been a lack of focus in the department and in government over you know previously. And that's why we have a workforce department now that's really looking at that, working with the universities and, and learning institutions. And as you know, that takes time. But uh, those are the things we need to do today if we're going to be able to sustain this down the road. So we take it very seriously. I think employee health and satisfaction is is, is uh, top of mind. We talk about psychological safe workplaces. Those things are, are, are key, um, and we need to do better at, at that. And so anything that the department can do to support health PEI in that, we're here to do that. We can reduce barriers. We can provide additional funding or resources. We can look at best other, other um, ways that we can uh, provide recruitment. We're doing that. We're, we've invested in, in, in uh, this budget uh, money to help look at, you know, to invest in recruiting uh, our senior staff and, and how do we acknowledge and value those in, in different ways. Um, and so the, absolutely, those are the things that we, we're talking about, we take seriously, we realize are important, and we want to have people come to work, you know, satisfied as you or I would every day as well. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I hope that we're beyond the conversation at this point. We've been talking about this for a very long time. And so it's concerning. I'm assuming that you're beyond conversations now and you're taking actions. The list of questions you just provided, again, with all due respect, are questions we've been asking for a very long time in our healthcare profession. Um, and, and I'm happy that you mentioned value, that, that our healthcare professionals need to feel valued, because right now they don't. And who's affected are islanders. That is a huge problem. Um, shifting gears a little bit, you mentioned when, um, when the nurses union was in, they talked about one of the big steps forward being um, 
having more seats in our in our programs and, and you had mentioned that there are talks going on with education partners I'm assuming those talks happened a long time ago so what action will be taken and what timeline can we expect sure. yeah so probably you know 18 20 months ago I just start co had conversations with learning institutions I met with the Dean of, of nursing for example uh, so this year we'll be seeing our in, our, our seats increased in, in nursing um, we expect that to increase this fall so we're going to see some action now uh, we've seen uh, increase in our LPNs that is starting now um, we've looked at ways to, to increase um, the enrollment in some of our programs where we're not getting you know 100% enrollment so we've seen that those gains in say our CW program for example so we have taken you know action to be able to move forward so it's not just all about sort of conversations we actually are seeing some really tangible things happening now our um, bridging program so we've, we've taken that we've, we're now extending that we're still um, growing that program so there are many things that we're doing tangible things to um, to make a difference and working with Holland College working with um, Marcus Stewart Ellis different different um, you got the wrong name but anyway working with some of those uh, learning institutions to see how can we get enrollment up how do we then look at providing them good clinical placements so we're, we're increasing our clinical placements so that students can have those opportunities we're looking at for example having we're I think the board's in the place right now of, of securing housing so that in, in, in say in rural PEI say in Western so that West Prince so that nursing students can go and do placements in those in those communities and have accommodations because sometimes accommodations is the barrier so we're doing those types of things so we're, we're now actively looking for for housing in different communities so that whether they're medical students whether they're uh, medical residents whether they're nursing students ecology students uh, and where we want them to, to branch outside of Charlottetown or Summerside we want to be sure that we, we those barriers so those are some of the tangible things that that are doing that matter to them we've talked to the students we've talked to the residents these are the things that they're telling us that that they want done and so we are taking action on that Great. Uh, Trish thank you chair um, so uh, you mentioned the the need to take a look at uh, these structures within health PEI uh, take a critical assessment and uh, and I, I think that there's certainly great value in that uh, and particularly the bureaucracy and what is and isn't working. Um, however, we do have to realize that the, the system that we have currently is the one that we need to work it within immediately. So when we're talking about the complement uh, of uh, for physicians, uh, that's, that's the current system we have. So um, we are in a place where we uh, you know, are needing to recruit uh, general surgeons to Prince County Hospital and you've said that you've recruited two successfully that will be starting soon There's been a recommendation from a group of doctors at Prince County Hospital as well as from uh, The health PEI board to increase the complement at Prince County Hospital of surgeons from three to four Will you be increasing the complement to four? Yeah, so I think the the um, the Premier has made it clear that if the recommendation from from Health PI is they want the fourth, then we will we will support that. Um, and so we haven't officially received that. I know there was a board motion, and we need to sort of unpack that a bit and understand. But nothing has come forward. The, our normal process is we have a physician recruiting or physician resource planning committee, and they do a sort of an impact analysis and make that recommendation. So we're not we're not a barrier to that. As soon as we get the the request to increase it, we 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 intend to improve it, approve it. We just approved a, a I think a fifth general surgeon for QEH. Um, and when we're looking at the recruitment piece, we're saying okay. You know, we have there's one recruit, for example, that's uh, going to be doing a fellowship. So, you know, they're going to be doing a long-term locum here, and our intent is that hopefully we can recruit him to stay for that fourth position. So, um, absolutely, we're committed to doing that if that's what they identify the the need to be. Minister. Uh, yes, thanks. And just to follow up on uh, the deputy's uh, comments, and I do thank you for uh, your question uh, on this and comment. Uh, it's one of the things from my perspective that was very positive is the fact the number of applications that did come in for that position of uh, and there were as I understand it six applications come in uh, back to uh, uh, increasing the complement up to four if a physician resource planning committee if that is the recommendation that comes in absolutely we will move forward on that Trish 
Thank you, Chair. And uh, it is, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there, there is uh, an understanding and, and commitment to, uh, to this, the idea of increasing to four. I do want to point out that what you've just described is perhaps one of those instances where the bureaucracy is, is holding up a process uh, that the recommendation is, is quite clear, you know, from the Health PEI Board that they, they do believe the complement should be increased to four. Now, in delaying that, of course, as you just described, uh, there have been, you know, six surgeons that are interested, uh, according to what you're reporting. Um, and in delaying that decision, we risk, you know, losing their interest over time. Who knows how long to increase to four and then go through the hiring process. We, we have this opportunity now where you've already gone through that process. You could simply offer four positions instead of six and, and just do it right away. So, so uh, I just want to point out that, you know, you've, you've sort of given a perfect example here of, of where the bureaucracy is, is, is failing our health care system. Um, I want to also just touch on, uh, you showed uh, some of the occupational projections for physicians across the country and those are of course some some staggering numbers uh, but breaking that down a little bit uh, the occupational projections for surgeons as I understand it are quite different in that we are currently training um, you know more surgeons than than we actually need or will need uh, in that specifically uh, so that's an interesting thing to consider when we're thinking about uh, you know the recruitment and retention of surgeons which is something that's been uh, you know, certainly on the minds of, of Islanders of late, and, and uh, it's my understanding we might be hearing of possible uh, other surgeons uh, who will also be leaving PEI soon. Um, in addition to that, I want to note that women are uh, graduating uh, as surgeons, uh, more women than men, and that's been the, the trend for several years. So um, I'm wondering if you can tell me how many of our current practicing surgeons on PEI are women, and are we successfully recruiting and retaining women surgeons here on Prince Edward Island? Sure, I can speak to that. Um, and so when we talk about um, surgeons, we talk like... So gynecologists are surgeons, orthopedics are surgeons. Like, so it's not just general surgery I think you're referring to. It's sort of the, the broad piece. Um, I do know that in this, for the two general surgeons, um, the two that offered, one's a male, one's a female. So that's, that's promising. Um, and so, yes, we are recruiting... Um, where we can, women into, into that field. We think there's real benefit of introducing women surgeons into, um, into, the, into our system. And, and we know there's sort of historical cultural things that come with surgeons. And so we're hoping that that will also, you know, improve some of those cultural um, uh, sort of tendencies and, and, and past practices. And so, yeah, so we certainly encourage that. Um, I don't have any statistics to say sort of, you know, I know in our gynecology, I could kind of go through the list of probably no orthopedic surgeons that are women and uh, urologists are not women. Um, but then, and uh, in um, nephrology wouldn't be, but then in that, that they do surgery. Um, but then there's other, yeah, so general and obstetrics would probably be the two areas right now that we have we have women and interest from women. So um, I think diversity and, and inclusion is something we're always, uh, from our perspective, from the department, we all encourage. And we'll be looking at how, I think, through the strategy, and Deborah's going to talk about the women's strategy, how we look at bringing them into, into our profession in different ways as well. Thanks, uh, Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to ask a couple of quick questions. I came today because my district is reaching out to me about what's happening at the PCH and with doctors that we're losing in a major way, I'm sure you can imagine. And when I saw that the agenda was going to cover recruitment and, and retention, I thought it was an important opportunity, not just to hear the good news stories of how many people we are recruiting, but to have an honest conversation about how we're doing with retention. I expected that conversation would be at least in part around the exit surveys that our caucus has been calling for to get a, an honest understanding of where we're going wrong and a game plan on how we're going to address those things. And I, I'm disappointed that that's not part of the discussion so far. Uh, so my question, my first of two, will be what are the exit surveys telling us and how are we addressing them? Sorry, I missed the second part of the question. Uh, sorry. Excuse, sorry about that, Chair. It was what are the exit surveys telling us and how are we addressing the gaps that they're identifying? Um, I think for us, I mean, we recognize the value of exit surveys, and, and when we came, uh, so came, when we came into the role, we recognized that that is a, a practice that well should have been done, and we, we you know we've asked to get done. Uh, there's been a number do, a, of surveys done, not not a high number of surveys done um, yet, and so we need to encourage more uptake and, and, and processes around that. We're also doing some what we call stay interviews. So it's not just when people are exiting. We also want to have conversations with individuals and, and how do we um, 
ensure that we address issues before they decide to leave. That's a, that's one of our strategies as well from a retention perspective. Um, I don't have the data. I can give sort of anecdotal information, but if you want, sort of, we can get you a summary of what we're seeing in there. But um, you know, workload can be an issue. It can be um, so people are getting you know that physician burnout, that health piece. Uh, some of our, our our staff have left. Physicians have left of due to medical reasons or health reasons. We know that, and we you know we'll speak to that. Um, yeah, there's definitely there was definitely challenges within that, but I think that. Um, Dr. Gardam and his team are, are really trying to address those heads on, head on, and we're seeing some some uh, friction as a result of that. Uh, but we are, there are some some issues within the within the physician community that we need to need to address, and um, you know that will help to uh, hopefully lead to to better um, better retention. Uh, I spoke sort of with with the medical society recently, and they are seeing a positive trend in, in in terms of their satisfaction now, and it's going it, physician satisfaction is going up. Um, they're recommending to you know, other colleagues. They're they're recruiting from from their from within their friends now. Uh, there's a real change in the tone in and. Um, uh, sort of approach with physicians is more physician centric, and so I think we're seeing some really positive gains that way. Um, and we're, you know, we're certainly going to. There's always going to be turnover, and we want to minimize that. Um, but we certainly want to make it so for even those that, that choose to say that their their experience is helpful. Um, back to sort of your question, I guess we'll, we'll we can get we'll try to get you some data. I haven't I haven't seen it. We requested it. it doesn't live with us. It lives with Health PEI. They're the employer, so um, we're still trying to trying to get that information from them. But um, I know Lori has done phone calls with individuals to understand what some of their challenges were when they were leaving some of the physicians. And so we have some anecdotal, we have some insight, but uh, don't have hard facts for you today. Lynn, final question, quickly. Thank you, Chair. I'm really surprised because this has been coming up since we were sitting in the legislature that no one has compiled that data into a report to assess it. I find that shocking. I actually think the minister had said that you did have a summary of that. So if you can get that sent to us, that would be fantastic. My second question will be, have you had a third party assess the working conditions at PCH to look at where the challenges are so we can make sure not just physicians aren't leaving, but healthcare providers broadly that, uh, are receiving good working conditions, and if there are challenges, we're addressing them? Third party. Third party. Third party. That's what that means. Oh, you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so we've we've had um, <laughs> we've done some some uh, focused. Um, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so we've done some focused um, um, reviews of um, investigations um, around, say, general surgery, for example. So we've we've been doing those. Uh, I know Dr. Gardam is is in has a, I think a contract signing a contract with someone from Ottawa that's going to be coming in and looking at this. At the, at the broader problem within Prince County, or the challenges within Prince County, to understand them so that we can address them sort of head on and, and um, understand where those uh, those issues lie. And so we're certainly committed to um, improving that. We see Prince County Hospital as a, a, an integral part of our system. We can't have it fail. We can't have it close. We need it to grow. We need strength to grow in from, from a surgery perspective. There's not capacity to even put them in Charlottetown. That's not what we're trying to do. We need, we need again, a community and citizen-centric approach to things. This is not about systems and providers' needs. It's really about what do we want for communities. And so we are putting in the, the time and the energy and, and the people to make sure that we really unpack what the challenges are there and that we can address them uh, head on and make the investments that we need. And if it's another another surgeon, we invest in another surgeon. If it's um, you know other ways we do anesthesiology, then we'll be investing in that as well. So uh, we really, and we've been talking about provincial surgical services for the last two years now. And so we're, we're ready to move forward with that plan. And, and I think this is good timing to really look at how we um, uh, structure that and so absolutely we're bringing in external people to help us with that and with the intent of making some some changes quickly so that we don't see further deterioration Great. Um, <clears throat> everything's r rolling along pretty smoothly uh, this far I know there's, these are important incredibly important topics um, we have three uh, areas left and I know that they're we could talk on each for a very long time. So I'm just asking maybe the presenters to look at um, trying to keep the presentation to within 10 minutes on each. 
uh, and then and then try to hit the highlights. And then after that, we will we will not stop in between each. Uh, we will ask questions at the end. So if we have a half an hour for presentations thereabouts, that would give us maybe 35 minutes for questions. There are general questions you can ask on all four topics and the beginning stuff. Is that okay? Ready to roll? And then rotating breaks. Uh, we're not taking a break, so if you if you need to rotate out, just just feel feel you can do that. So I'll uh, I'll pass it over to President. We'll, we'll kind of skip through this probably a little bit more quickly. Um, as I mentioned early on, we do we really do want to promote uh, support primary care. It's it's really the the strength in terms of our overall system. There's less, less reliance on emergency departments and, and acute care. Uh, people receive care earlier and uh, their conditions are managed uh, more effectively. And so we're, we're following sort of suit with, with other, other provinces. Our College of Family, um, College of Family Physicians um, has, has a model that, that, that they've been promoting and endorsing and we've been working with them and we're now implementing that. The, and we've heard about the medical homes and neighborhoods. Uh, we're quite excited about how we're sort of um, realigning our, our services to better support um, Islanders and so that they're also attached to more more resources, more adequate resources, um, and receive better care as a result of that. And so you're really your patient medical home is not a, necessarily a, a one location. A medical home could span um, more than a, a variety of locations. So you might be a, your primary provider might be the nurse practitioner at Chances, but you're also attached to a medical home perhaps in downtown Charlottetown. And so you'll have access to the same types of services, those primary care services as you need. So whether it's a diabetes educator, it's a social worker, it's an uh, advanced primary care nurse, you need access to INR, uh, INR monitoring, you need uh, blood work, um, whatever that might be, that will all be encompassed within your medical home. And so whether they go to Chances or for some of those services um, or, or patients from Chances go to the other location or other locations, it's all integrated into your care. It's all in, in your chart. It's all, and, and providers are talking with one another, you know, sort of afterwards behind the scenes to make sure care is coordinated um, and that services are, that people are getting the best outcomes for their, for their mental, for the medical issues. Um, Deborah will get into this in a bit more detail. Uh, and then sort of the, the home fits within your broader neighborhood. And, and the other things in your neighborhood are your, your hospitals or your long-term care facilities. Uh, it's your home care. It's your community pharmacists. It's your NGOs. All of those groups that, that, that contribute to that. And how does that medical home then speak to and work in collaboration with those that with that neighborhood um, and if you're you know in the neighborhood can be different if you have a cancer diagnosis and you live in in Montague well part of, part of your neighborhood might mean the cancer treatment center in Charlottetown so how are they working together behind the scenes as well and how is your care being coordinated that's really what we're trying to say around these patient medical homes and they're not sort of fixed locations necessarily it's more the that the that they're integrated and coordinating in a way so that it, it makes it easier for for patients uh, to act access care and, and ultimately receive um, better care. I'm going to turn it over to Deborah Bradley. Yeah, um, thank you um, for the invitation and good morning. Uh, just to add a little bit to what Mark had said, at the real core of the patient medical home is the team-based care. So that is, uh, that's the core and that's where we're going to focus um, a lot of energy on creating highly functioning um, team-based care. Also, I wanted to note that both the patient medical home as well as the patient medical neighborhood, um, based on uh, work that the College of Family Physicians have done, so our model um, is based on uh, theirs uh, and we have, their, we have their endorsement and have been engaging with the local chapter. So when we uh, started to do um, the work to develop uh, a strategy for primary care, we initially thought we would develop a five-year strategy. Um, then the pandemic hit and we had to shift courses a little bit because it really changed how primary care was being delivered on PEI. And we didn't know if we could kind of project out five years. So um, the goal then turned into developing a two-year roadmap with the focus on um, that team-based uh, care. So what we really want to um, achieve is um, a, a governance model, priority areas for action um, that enhance access to care for Islanders by a multidisciplinary team. And as we 
come to the tail end of that two-year roadmap, we'll then start working on the five-year strategy. Uh, the pandemic hopefully will be over by then, and we'll have a good sense of the, of the landscape. But we wanted to pay attention to some of the urgent needs that needed to be addressed um, now. So, um, and a, a big part of the approach that we're taking is uh, using innovation and really leveraging innovation. We want to be able to test our models and then spread. So the approach is not a cookie cutter approach. So um, uh, Islanders will have access to a primary care team um, in their community, but it may look different depending on where you live. So the providers from that community, the uh, residents of that community, will help define what the services are. So there may be one part of the um, province has a higher rate of um, older adults, more older adults. So we need to look to ensure that we provide those um, services to um, older adults. Another community may have a very young population with growing families. So we have to make sure that our homes and neighborhoods um, support them as well. <clears throat> So there's a lot on this slide, um, but it gives you a real sense of where we're going um, in establishing the primary care patient me uh, medical homes. Um, so on this slide, you see the four blue bubbles in, in the center. Um, those are areas where we'll be creating um, new um, patient medical homes, so team-based care. Um, there's one in the West Prince area, one in, in Kings, uh, one around Summerside, Kensington, as Mark had said. Um, you don't need, doesn't necessarily have to be in one location. There could be a home that's shared over two locations. And then two in the Charlottetown area, given the high, shouldn't say Charlottetown, let's say Queens, because um, uh, the high population density in this area. And so looking at that, some of these may be, in fact, brand new teams. Uh, some may be shoring up and building on existing teams to meet um, the needs in that community. Within, within those uh, dark blue bubbles are identified um, the additional health professionals that will be added. Uh, so uh, in addition to those numbers, um, there are also support staff such as LPNs and medical secretaries. So uh, we want to add um, uh, uh, family physicians, so 9.6 additional family physicians across the island. We want to add six nurse practitioners um, to work collaboratively with the physicians and other team members. Uh, 5.2 um, uh, registered nurses, those are cro focusing on chronic disease management, whether it's diabetes, it's COPD, it's congestive heart failure. Um, and we also recognize the importance of um, mental health. So we are adding social workers as well, three social workers to the province. Um, for primary care and the um, what we eat matters too and how we move matters. So we're also looking at adding uh, additional uh, registered dietitians. So the, the staff here are above and beyond what's currently in, in place uh, within primary care. And I also want to know, because it's really important, I made the reference to uh, it's, important, it's important what we eat and how we eat and where we eat and food security, but it's also important is being able, that moving part. And for, uh, so we're looking at community-based rehab with the addition of OTs and PTs, and we'll probably start small there, um, test the model in one or two of the patient medical homes, and then spread that, spread that out. And as we, we also know that we have a growing um, aging population, so critically important um, that we su uh, support those, and if somebody's injured, that we're able to support um, those to recover, those individuals to recover it well. So at the bottom of this slide um, are our priorities. So it's all about improving access and having equitable access. So the access may not, may not be the same everywhere, um, but it's equitable. We want to accelerate team-based care. Care. That's foundational. It's important that we leverage um, innovation, and we've been doing that already, such as um, virtual care applications. So individuals currently on the patient uh, registry, they have an access, uh, they have access to the Maple platform to see a primary care physician uh, virtually. And then it's critical as we develop our neighborhoods and look at how our teams develop, that we that our services are well coordinated 
and integrate it. So that would be looking at shared care models, maybe with mental health and addictions or home care, also working uh, with other departments such as social development and housing. So looking at a shared care model uh, with social programs as one as another example. Um, so to the next slide, Mark. So we've received funding uh, to begin this work, uh, approximately uh, $4 million uh, for this fiscal year, uh, annualized out at, a, at about eight. Um, so we've been spending time um, making sure that we have the infrastructure in, in place to support um, the new model of care, because it will require a lot of change management, and so we'll need change agents as part of the process. So we do have our governance structure. We're not doing this alone. Uh, we are working uh, closely with Health PEI, so our responsibility in this was to uh, create the roadmap. Um, there will be things that we will be supporting, such as um, resource mapping in communities, but it primarily will be operationalized um, by Health PEI. So we have some joint, we have some joint governance structures there. Uh, we're in the process of hiring uh, project leadership staff. Uh, we have really strong partners that we're working with, uh, such as um, the Medical Society PEI, College of Family Physicians, and we also have frontline clinical champions, which will be critical as change agents to have both champions, local champions on the clinical front as well as the administrative uh, front. And I will say um, within this model, um, it, it doesn't matter what your payment modality is. You could be a fee-for-service fee physician, you could be a salary physician, you could be on contract. Um, in, in the past, that was a little bit of a barrier to accessing those um, auxiliary supports other than physician and MP support. So. That's, that won't be the case going, going forward. And we're working on internal um, and external communication plan, and, and we, we do plan to do a traveling uh, road show. Next slide, Mark. Um, so in addition to some of the other um, elements that I've talked to, what we're doing right now in terms of the patient medical home is establishing that application process and the, and, and, uh, the criteria required um, to be a part of a, a team-based care. And I think I, I heard, I'm not sure it was here or maybe another day, talking about um, like accountability agreements. What we really want people who want to come and be um, a part of these teams is to... Um, to like sign on, you know, this is what we're willing to do. Let's talk about the gives and the gets. And so there are some requirements to be a part of a, a team. We no longer uh, want to work, have si siloed practices. Um, and we know um, both, both from Islanders as well as from providers. Islanders um, have appreciated when they're able to access team-based care. Providers are telling us that's how they want to work. That's how they're being educated now. So um, we will be looking at creating those accountability agreements. There are about 10 groups across the province that have already expressed um, interest without us going out and saying, well, this is the criteria. Um, so we know there will be a lot of um, uptake, which is excellent news. And also, we, with new teams and bringing on additional staff, there are spacing requirements. So we're currently exploring what those spacing requirements are. As you would be aware, we have some in our capital budget um, already, um, but we're going to need more space. We have been working closely uh, with frontline um, staff uh, as we develop the process. They'll also be involved in the implementation. Um, and we, for recruitment of frontline staff, we're working closely with recruitment and retention. Uh, as Mark had mentioned, all physician postings have been up. Nurse practitioner nurse practitioner postings, plus the others uh, coming in uh, coming uh, weeks. Um, yeah, that's it for that slide, Mark. I'm talking really fast because I, I want to get it done in 10 minutes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, some other uh, progress today. So a tremendous enabler is our electronic medical record. 
um, our EMR system. So, th so that will allow providers to share information. Uh, it will be a central repository. Individuals only have to tell their story once. It's going to be really, really enhance um, client care and provider satisfaction. And so we want to make sure that there's alignment as new teams are implemented, that they have access to the EMR. So if you have, if you have a, a, a medical home that's across, across two sites, you want to be able to uh, access that individual's information regardless of what site you're, so site you're at. So we've identified eight initial um, locations. I'm not at liberty to share them just yet. Um, and planning though is underway to begin launching those in April, sorry, May, I don't know where we, in July, next month, <laughs> next month. Um, we're very fortunate, we've worked with the federal government in access funding for a virtual uh, care um, action plan. During the pandemic, the uptake of virtual care was phenomenal. I think uh, across the country, it was about 60% of citizens were using virtual care, kind of dipped down, um, you know, below around 30%, um, you know, the tail mid part of the pandemic to, towards the end, but now it's starting to go up again to about 40%. Um, I was on a um, FPT forum on uh, virtual care on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, and we were talking about how important when you apply virtual care, it's a it's a tool in your toolkit. It's not it's not the end end all, um, and we talked about the importance of the team based care along with virtual care and virtual care being an enabler. Um, so I've already uh, mentioned uh, Maple for the unaffiliated um, residents of PEI. Within that three-year plan, we're also looking at secure messaging. It could be between patient and provider, uh, whether it's email, texting, uh, et cetera. So that's secure, um, and it could be from provider to provider as well. We want to make sure that there's equity across the province when we implement virtual care. So something that comes to mind for me is a couple of things. Um, to um, providers and the residents of PEI have the tools they need to access virtual care? Um, do they have the education required to kind of hop on and do that video conference uh, call? So we're going to pay attention to that and invest in those areas. And also um, thinking about uh, rural PEI and internet access, so that is a bit of a barrier to virtual care um, as well. And some people may not have um, their, their resources to purchase um, uh, an iPad or an iPhone or have the health literacy um, perhaps to engage in a, in a virtual um, meeting with your primary care provider. So we're also interested in setting up um, uh, community spaces uh, where that could be facilitated. Uh, remote patient monitoring. Uh, we already have remote patient monitoring, for example, congestive heart failure. Um, the in, uh, vitals from your home are fed into um, uh, a system. A nurse or another provider can access that to see if there are any red flags, give you a call if you need any assistant medication adjustment, or can go out to visit you uh, if you need to, um, if that is determined. And um, we need to support and improve infrastructure and supports. And I think I've talked a, bit, a little bit about that already. So another exciting um, thing that we're doing that will enhance um, access to care um, is uh, mobile integrated health. <clears throat> We already have mobile integrated health, uh, seniors um, check-in program, uh, paramedics providing palliative care at home, uh, a couple um, that are included in the both the primary care roadmap as well as the seniors health services plan is, um, is around um, bridging rapidly from the emergency department to home. We're going to start with um, community care facilities. What we're seeing is a number of individuals within community care end up going to the emergency department admitted by hospital because they're not able to access that care where they are. So paramedics and, and home care are part of this um, this project. So they can be, um, they're not admitted to hospital, they're returned home with the necessary bridging supports until home care or other providers can um, pick up that client. Um, and then a subsequent um, initiative would be from inpatient to home, the, sa the same sort of model. Uh, so <clears throat> with this new model, excuse me, uh, we 
these are some of the outcomes or objectives. A better um, Islanders have better uh, chronic disease management, greater uh, access to services across the, the province with equity of resources. So if you saw where the new health resources are going, it's uh, across, the, across the province. Um, better able to handle those medical complex uh, cases, care closer to home. We talked about recruitment and retention. I think um, primary care is the cornerstone of the health care system. And if we have le less reliance on bed-based care, um, then we're going to have a more sustainable health care system uh, that's more affordable. And also, I talked about the importance of working um, with other departments and, and thinking about social complexity and other supports required. That's it for me. Thanks. <clears throat> Perfect. Thanks, Deb. On that uh, one. Did I, I do it in check. 10 minutes? You tell me yeah, if I need yeah. to speed up. Oh, yeah. That was, that, was 10, that was good 10 minutes. That was good. Um, I just want to check with the committee for a second. We're, we're into, we've got, we've got two topics down. Um, before we move to the next two, um, we're obviously struggling with time. Um, d is it the committee's will to maybe look at questions on those, those two areas and the beginning presentation? And then potentially asking our guests to come in to speak on the next two to give. I just, uh, I just want to check with the committee, uh, Michelle. Chair, yeah, I would 100% agree with that because I don't want to rush the uh, yeah. next two. I think it's important to spend yeah. the time on it. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay. Is our presenters okay with that? It's it's been rich and this yeah, is yeah totally okay. So I just don't want to like these are important topics and I just want us to, to all relax and ask ask questions on what we've done so far. I think you've set out a good plan, and then we hit two uh, different topics. So <clears throat> maybe we will let the we'll we'll stop stop there on the presentations, and then the clerk can set up with the department about another time to come in and, and do that. So um, we have a little bit more time now for, for questions on, on various topics that we've seen so far. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll start with, uh, I'll give the committee members uh, a little bit more time with their questions. Uh, we'll start with Rob. Uh, yeah, just so I, I mean, these, this is, these medical homes, neighborhoods, and things of that nature <clears throat> I've been asking a lot of questions about it in the legislature, and obviously I come from a community that has the O'Leary Health Center, and then there's the Tignish Health Center, Tyne Valley Health Center, and Alberton has a facility too. Um, and you talk about you're going to be recruiting like 9.6 doctors, 6 nurse practitioners, and 3 social workers. These are new positions, I'm assuming, from that, uh, and I'm assuming that you're kind of focused, the main focus is on the 21,000 uh, unaffiliated patients at the moment uh, for these, I mean, I may include more than that, but uh, so will existing nurse practitioners and existing physicians be able to apply to, for these positions uh, or, you know, because we don't want to be in a situation where we're just robbing Peter to pay Paul. So in other words, if I have four practicing physicians at the Larry Health Center, um, and uh, one of them goes to the, this, this position. Now I've all, all of a sudden added another 2,000 patients to the, the problem here. So uh, can you maybe enlighten me a little bit more on how that's going to work from within the existing structure that we have? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an excellent uh, question. And you're right, those new resources for the West Prince area are above and beyond the resources that currently uh, exist there. And um, the intent is to um, have more people attached to uh, primary care, but also um, enhance the services that we offer. So if you look at adding a social worker and a dietitian to that area, it, it enriches um, the, the services that are, that are available in that community. So we talked a lot about um, the recruitment process uh, already. Um, and so uh, currently our practice would be that these positions would be posted. So I mentioned the physician positions are already up, the nurse practitioner positions will be up shortly. Um, and you're right, um, anybody can apply for those positions. So there will be a domino uh, effect. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we're able to draw um, new people into the system. Uh, we do know of approximately eight to ten nurse practitioners who have reached out to the department to express interest in um, in working in PEI. Some are um, new graduates, some are from Etta Province. So I think um, that we will um, uh, be able to recruit new health professionals into the province as well. Mark, do you want to add? Just, just just to add, so um, physicians are not going to be moving to a, a center per se. So there's a, there's been an expression of interest put out to physicians that want to create team-based care, so their patients will stay with them. So they may move into a 
team-based care approach, but they won't be leaving a practice to go to another practice. So, <clears throat> so we'll, be, we'll be putting the resources around those, those, um, those uh, patients. So there may be three or four physicians in O'Leary that say, okay, let's create that home, hire some nurse practitioners, some social workers, dietitians, and we'll, cr we'll support those 10,000 patients. Um, so patients will not lose a physician. If their physician goes into team-based care, the patients go with them. My only comment on that is, is that uh, that's assuming that they're not busy currently. I mean, if I look at the, the four in, in O'Leary, the nurse practitioners, that's exactly what you have. You have, you have a, a home in, in O'Leary that's a health yeah. center, and a, you have a collaborative practice, of the, and all these things are in, in place. But, but uh, if you're adding that these unaffiliated patients are going to be able to uh, access services at that location, to which uh, some of them can at different services as well, uh, then, then who's going to provide it if it's not an additional position? And if... Uh, a person is taking this position, still saying where they're at, then then so, something's got to give. I, I just don't understand how you're not going to have something giving here unless you're adding a lot more positions to it. And I, I like the idea of more nurse practitioners. Nothing wrong with that. So uh, that's where those 9.6 FTEs will... So when they come, they'll be bringing the patients off the patient registry. So we're not taking them and giving them to the physicians that already have a full practice. So in West Prince, we've, we've added another physician there. And they'll be taking those patients that are unaffiliated um, and bringing them into that team-based care. So it won't be putting burden on our existing clinicians. We're actually adding the capacity for them to be able to take on those um, unaffiliated patients. But still 20,000 unaffiliated patients in Prince Edward Island. I mean, that, that's a huge number. That, that would take care of your full 10 physicians, <laughs> to which you can't fill now. I, I'm just really struggling with the, the fact that it, uh, how realistic and happening in a quick fashion that this is. I'm not against the concept. In general terms, I would say the concept already exists with, the, with our health centers across the island. I would take this would be a perfect example of having that type of, a, of a, a service provided. Maybe not as extensive. It's, you know, I, it's hard to know exactly what this is. So, so I'm just struggling with that, and I'm really wondering the operational budget of that in, in all these additional positions, uh, because I, I know certainly in the social worker situation, if I look at the Public Service Commission vacancies and social workers, that's massive <laughs> too. So, uh, so once again, you're going to be taking somebody from some other position already in the system to transfer them over to a different position. And uh, I'm hearing the same thing with, uh, within long-term care and home care. I mean, uh, if the, we add more long-term care positions, it's the people leave home care to go to long-term or to home care support. So you're, you're really robbing Peter to pay Paul, and it, it seems to can be continuing under this model. So I, I'll, you can respond to that. I appreciate that. Uh, I guess you look uh, at uh, the additional positions, uh, uh, FTEs, uh, with regard to family doctors. Uh, one of the slides that was presented here earlier, it showed the present vacancies as well as the additional positions and the interest that has been indicated, which uh, if I recall correctly from that slide was 10. So I think, uh, and you look at the number of ones that are unaffiliated islanders or on the registry, when you combine those positions of the additional 9.6 and the present vacancies of family doctors, that will make a tremendous impact, really, on the number of, uh, of individual islanders who are on the registry. And then when you top that up with additional nurse practitioners, that's going to aid in making even a greater dent on that. Uh, so it's, something, it's not something that's going to happen, be able to happen overnight, but all of those uh, positions with regard to family doctors are posted, uh, and as I'd indicated, 10 who are interested, expressed an interest in coming to the island. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, Rob, you know one right from O'Leary who is going into, uh, into a residency program here in the island who wants to ultimately set up in West Prince. I think one of the things, too, that is so important in this hall is we roll this out. And it has been a challenge over the last number of years is electronic medical records. And that is a major step. The fact that the contract is signed, that uh, we are, as uh, Deborah has stated, uh, rolling it out uh, very shortly. Uh, we want to make sure, absolutely, like anything else, that it's done properly. And because of that, it's going to be a staged rollout. But uh, it's, it's an integral part 
of, uh, of a whole process, of a whole concept of medical homes. I'm sure, Rob, you think back how it was so siloed in West Prince a number of years ago, you know that yourself, and how much better the healthcare system has evolved there with regard to uh, uh, our service providers working together. And, uh, you know, this is another step in that direction, I feel. Just one final comment, too. So, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to make a paradigm shift, so less reliance on acute care and putting our services into primary care. And we know there's going to be a period of time where we have, where I will adjust and transition. It, it, we need more people, but the idea is not to be putting more investments into our acute care, into our long-term care. So those people that are there now, eventually, will be helping to support more, or the, the demand for that won't grow, where we want to see the, grant, the, the demand grow on the community side. So if people are, are healthier, they don't need emergency as much, they don't need hospital as long, um, you know, we're really putting the resources where we should be putting them to get better outcomes for, for Islanders. I, say, I wish you all the best, and I'll say just a lot of ifs there, and I've sort of said the same things in the past, too, and they never materialize. It's, it's a tough game you're, you're playing here, and I just think there's a lot of ifs, and uh, if wishes were horses, uh, Problems would be solved pretty easy, but that's not the way it is. And I do appreciate your comments, Rob. Like, uh, you've been uh, in the seat, you know, the challenges that, that are involved. But as I've said before, we have these challenges. You look at, uh, at how you can address them and what the opportunities are. And certainly, one of the things that we have heard, and I'm sure that you've uh, heard when you were in this chair, is just the importance of our frontline staff working together in a collaborative nature. And you see it, uh, you know, this is one of the things that we are uh, moving forward with. When we look at primary care, whether it's uh, the island of needs, whether it's physical, whether it's mental health, and to be able to encompass all of that uh, and provide that service to islanders as close as possible to home, as I mentioned. And that's one of the things when we look at the medical homes, medical neighborhoods, EMRs, to be able to provide that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Michelle? Thanks, Chair. Um, so can I go back to the overview? You had mentioned, um, this is just a really quick, an accountability framework. I'm wondering, can you table that for us? Instead of walking us through it, can you table a complete framework for us? Yeah, and that'll be from a public document. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, so it's uh, signed, certainly, uh, that will be public, and uh, I'm glad to make sure that all of the committee members, all MLAs for that matter, uh, are aware of when it is public. Sure. And looking for details, not just, not there just be, the... Right, so there, there will be schedules that, that will change. So there will be a framework that talks about our relationships and how we work, and then there will be specific schedules that we'll be putting in place that will change over time as needs are changing and addressing, yeah. Um, sure. So I did want to talk about, thank you um, for covering off the EMR section of it. I did want to just ask, because that, that's a concern. If you're going to make a collaborative work environment, everybody needs to have access to the information so that you're not, so that you know how you're, um, how, how you're all interacting with the patient. I've been asked several times, is there a patient portal? Yes. And will that be in phase one? Yes. Okay. And what about allied health care providers? Will OTs, physiotherapy, their physiotherapists, will everybody be able to access the um, EMR? Right, so from in terms of accessing, so some will actually populate it and will be using it as their yeah. chart, but yes, people will be able to access the components that they need, um, no different than they can access their hospital records and things. So it, it all becomes one, ultimately, from a, from a viewing perspective and getting the information you need, they'll have access to that. Okay. Michelle? And in phase one, like is it, it, will it all be delivered at the same time? So, um, so the first thing is to get them into into the physician offices and get them using them, and the teams that are associated with the physicians will be using them. Um, I'm not sure exactly, and then and I'm not sure how the the view only function works and when we get people trained, but it'll be probably the tail end of that. Michelle. Sure. All right. Thank you. So, question on. Um, let me reread re re this. Sorry. Um, for the locations that you're selecting, how are you basing your decision? Are you basing your decision on, I think you had alluded to, like where the need is, and how are you ensuring that there's no political interference to where you're going to be moving a health center 
and actually addressing the need of patients in different areas of the island. Yeah, so I think I can start and then we can yeah. add in. So it's, it's about, and one of the positive things here is that family physicians are, there's a readiness by family physicians to do this. And so probably 10 years ago, it wasn't the same level of readiness. And although things have been, you know, tried in the past, maybe haven't, haven't been successful, but um, so we're, we're going where the, where the physicians are and where, where there's expression of, of, of need, uh, of interest. Um, it's also about where we actually have space to be able to do that um, and where we have the teams to do it. It's not a political decision in any way. It's really the health authorities helping to make those decisions. There's a committee in place um, involving front line, you know, college of family physicians, medical societies, and all of the rest. Uh, but it's also where, where is there, where is there um, an ability to do it? And so, for example, you know, we look at, say, Crapo and Cornwall. Well, there's the space, we have the space now in, in Crapo. Uh, we have the professionals that are there. So it would be an easy thing to get up and running. Um, so it's not a political thing. It's more just where is there an ability to do it sooner rather than later. Michelle? Sure. All right. I don't know uh, how many questions you're asking. Yeah, and then I will. I know there's a, a really short core. Like that was. Well, that was good. <laughs> um, I want to go back to accountability. So on your overview, <clears throat> you talked about sets vision, priorities, and strategic plans. Um, yeah, health promotion. Um, one of the big things that Dr. Garden talked about was communications and how all communications have to come out of the department, which is it really a hindrance to health PEI? Yes. Can you tell me why? all the communication has to come out of the department and why you're not giving health PEI the flexibility to be able to communicate the way they see fit? Uh, sure. So I think there's there's sort of two streams of communication, I think, when, it, when we look at it. Some of it impacts the ministry um, and involves, you know, information the ministry needs to speak to. And so we, we, look at it, we, look at, we look at it from that perspective. There's lots of information, though, that goes out in social media and goes out in other ways that the authority manages, and they have additional resources now to be able to do that. Um, and so there's a, always going to be a, a conversation of what goes out, because I think, as, as you can appreciate, the ministry needs to know if, if there's a disruption in service, for example, um, and um, or there's a rollout of a new program. We need to be aware of what that is. And so <clears throat> there's times where we need to do it jointly, and there's times that they can do it themselves. Comms is also centralized within government. It's not within our department, per se. Um, but really, we're, we're, it's, we're not heavily, in, for my, my involvement anyway, not heavily involved in, in crafting that. It's a matter of um, do we agree with... Are we aware of what's happening? What nine times out of ten? It's here's here's a, here's a, going to be a news release. Okay, it sounds good. And off it goes. Um, but there's and, and but again, there's lots of internal comms within their own organization that they that they manage, and it's through social media, it's through the, through regular media, and the rest. Mr. Hudson. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Just with regard to communications and uh, to follow up on some of the points that uh, that uh, Deputy has made, like communications uh, that uh, quote from Health PEI, they would be uh, provided to me at the time that they go out for my information, as they should be. Uh, there would be times that uh, communications or calm statement go out from health and wellness. These would be uh, initiated by a request from uh, media, whether it's uh, CBC, Guardian, or where have you. Uh, the only time that personally I would have any influence over what is going out in that comms would be if it's actually a press release where I'm going to be quoted. And obviously, my quote is my quote. Um, Take it maybe to a little lower level, though. It's one of the things that I had mentioned previously. I think it's so important that we do not operate in silos. We have Health PEI. Health PEI has its operational jurisdiction. Health and Wellness has its accountability, its uh, responsibility. Having said that, though, we always have to have the communications back and forth. And it goes back to the fact that the chair, uh, my deputy, myself, the CEO, meet on a regular basis to have those discussions. Uh, another thing that I have found extremely positive uh, with regard to communications is my deputy, myself, chief medical officer, and the CEO have a conference call each week uh, that uh, goes for, you know, 
uh, on average, at least an hour, sometimes substantially longer than that. But it is a matter of, uh, of having those communications open. And uh, I think, personally, uh, I've found it extremely helpful. I would hope that the others have as well. And I think it's a step in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, quick comment. Just a comment, though. If you heard what Dr. Gardner said last week, it might be beneficial to you, Minister, but it's not beneficial as the organization, especially when they're supposed to be arm's length. And so I understand that there needs to be communications between the 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 um, the department and the arm's length health body, but it doesn't mean that the department should be sending out the communications on their behalf, and that's coming directly from the CEO with a concern around there. So I suggest that that conversation happen so that Islanders are getting the information that they require clearly and con concisely and timely. That's... I would do very much. Dr. Gerdham stated that what uh, I just referred to of uh, the regular meetings of the chair, the deputy, myself, and the CEO, as well as the weekly calls, are not beneficial. Thank, thank you. That was a good debate. Um, Carla? Thank you, Chair. Um, Deborah, I couldn't help you notice, help notice that you sitting back there and, and a few times you wanted to say something, so I, I'm hoping that, that you... <laughs> um, so uh, I really like this idea of medical homes. I think that if done, planned, rolled out efficiently and properly by investing in community-based care is proven to, to, um, to have benefits for women, those who identify as so, members of the 2SLGBTQIA community, um, <coughs> members of the BIPOC community, children, and all of our marginalized communities, which has never been, I mean, it's always been super important, but given everything that's happening, it's even more so, more pressing now. Um, so uh, I'm going to keep this to two, even though I kind of have three questions, but I'm wondering how you see this model of care improving uh, mental health and addiction services. That's a, that's a great question, and there are a number of ways um, that I would, I would view an opportunity to improve um, services, mental health addictions, and, and, the, um, and how Islanders access that service. So uh, currently within primary care, um, there is some uh, mental health uh, delivery uh, for, say, mild to moderate depression and anxiety. Um, and we recognize um, that there needs to be an entry port, point for Islanders to the to the system, uh, and primary care makes the most sense for that <clears throat> initial point of, of entry. So we identified that need many, many years ago and started building um, that shared care model uh, within primary care. So we do plan to add additional um, social workers um, into, into the primary care teams. Uh, we also are, are looking to create a um, shared care model with mental health and addiction. So if there are um, common um, clients of primary care and mental health and addiction, uh, make sure that the health professionals are, are working together, um, collaborating, and at the most appropriate purpose provider um, sees that individual. So I see through these teams um, enhanced access to mental health and addiction services. Not all um, uh, mental health and addiction services need to be um, delivered by um, psychiatrists, as an example, or psychologists. They can be by your um, social worker, uh, your primary care uh, nurse, your family physician. So we want to enrich um, our ability to do that in primary care, but working alongside and with uh, mental health and addictions uh, as we do that. The other component too for people with mental health and addictions, depending on the severity, they also need to be able to, they need support say from social programs, social development and housing. So we want to integrate those services. It's also about, we've seen where there's a lack of communication between family physicians and psychiatrists, for example. So having the electronic medical record is going to help us understand each other's care plans and how can the team then support what the psychiatry and the mental <coughs> health team are doing. And so having that case coordination, that care coordination uh, within your medical home I think is going to be really invaluable. Um, also being able to access things virtually through your home, medical home, as I said, you know, outside of the province even for some specialty mental health uh, addiction care. And how do we then, it becomes part of your chart, it becomes part of your circle of care. It's not something that happens in isolation. So I think the 
really the intent is to pull all those together and a lot of the a lot of the navigation can happen behind the scenes but right now people have to navigate themselves and as you know with someone with a mental health or addiction issue it's even harder so we really want to set them up so that we take care of all of those sort of navigational components the care case planning and really help them focus on what are the things so whether it's you know we've heard before you know it's I'm worried about mental health but I'm more worried about getting pampers for my for my child so let's work on that let's get that connected immediately and, and create those pathways so that those barriers to that or barriers to getting medication are being addressed which really prevents you from taking care of your primary health Carol? thank you chair and I oh, sorry Deborah uh, additional comments sorry um, and uh, Mark talked early on about uh, priority within the department is, is wellness. Um, and so that will be integrated into the primary care um, teams as well uh, to do some upfront health promotion uh, work that will benefit um, mental well-being. Thank you for that. And, and I'm so happy to hear that because one of the things Dr. Gardam said that, that I've but that's been my perception of our healthcare system in PEI. It's very much based on a reactive mm -hmm. model, and there is no preventative care. As much as we would like to say there is or, or provide that care, it's just we don't have the capacity to do that, and that's a severe disservice to all of us. Um, so I, I really like, you know, the EMR records, I think, is really going to be a key thing here in terms of people not re-traumatizing themselves and, and having to tell their stories several times or telling it to someone and then it get going being misplaced. So I think that that's a key piece to this. Um, and, and Mark, what you added to the conversation kind of leads nicely into my, to my next question. As we consider mental health and addictions, chronic disease, preventative care, all of, all of the things really, continuity of care is, is greatly lacking in our current system. And, you know, for example, when I worked at the addiction facility, when you talk about working with social programming, we would often have people graduating out of the transition program who were leaving and we were waving saying goodbye knowing they had nowhere to live. The transition homes were full and they literally had nowhere to go when they left. We put them in a taxi, but we didn't know where they were going. Um, which is devastating and, and shocking and a little embarrassing. So, so how do you see this model of care improving continuity of care between services? Yeah, and that's great. And I think um, we'll use the mental health, the example that you have I think is a great example. And so when we're looking at our mental health campus right now, I talked about how it's not a like for like facility and people are gonna be transitioning out. So um, many times people end up in hospital because they have nowhere else to go. And they have, may have behavioral challenges, but it's not a mental health challenge and they kind of fall through the gaps. And so what we're trying to do now is create that sort of housing continuum. So how can health go and support the individuals that are either are homeless or that are and need a supportive housing that would otherwise be homeless. Um, how do we put wraparound services around them so that we can deliver that in a, in a quality, safe way that they can live there? So we're working now with social development housing to look at their housing continuum and where do we fit in and how do we support that? So people aren't being institutionalized, they're not being admitted to hospital uh, or in, in, in those types of ideas. So that's where we see the breakdown. And having been in social development housing, that's where I see where the breakdown is. So the health system really needs to work more broadly with other partners, whether it's with QCRSs of the world or it's with uh, social development housing or other, other areas. So I think this really allows us to fill in some of those gaps and, and be a supportive role. So sometimes we're seen as the lead role, but really we should be the supportive role when housing's your bigger, bigger issue. We can house you and we can keep you safe and we can feed you in a hospital, but that's not good quality care for, for that individual. So we really sometimes need to be supportive of when before we maybe we haven't been as integrated. So we're, we want to go to the table. We want to go to their tables. We want to fit into the poverty reduction strategy. We want to fit into the housing strategy um, so, that, so that that continuity does happen and that providers are talking to one another at the front line. Deb had a comment and then Minister. Um, <clears throat> I was going to comment that uh, the transition in care, uh, that's critically important. Uh, when you uh, look at services moving like uh, uh, from one program area to another, from one department to another, or as we uh, move along our from cradle to grave approach, you know, we need to pay <coughs> extra attention to those transitions um, in ca care. And I think within the primary care teams, having the approach as collaborative case management is one of the, the tenets of, 
that. Um, that also facilitates um, some of those transitions in care, whether it's with social programs, because we know health, as the minister described at the onset, health is much more th than just our physical health, and we need to pay attention to our social determinants of health as w as equally. Um, and so uh, part of this would be to actually be working with social programs or working with the education system uh, as children age from um, you know high school uh, into adulthood and what supports that they may need. So all of those pieces are, are critical and that collaborative case management I think plays a key role. Oh, sorry, Mr. Hazen. No, oh, thanks, Chair. No, I appreciate, Carla, your, uh, your comment with regard to reaction because we have to get by that. We absolutely do. Uh, when you're always, as a department, uh, or any department, reacting, then it doesn't provide the opportunity. Your focus is not where it should be. It should be on how can we improve, uh, and you do learn from that reaction, but I do appreciate uh, your comment on that and say I agree 100% that we do have to get by that. And I think that we are making uh, progress to get by it. And again, we've heard from different members the importance of EMR, and I think that that is one of the tools that will enable us to. Uh, it's also, and again going back to EMR, and uh, to Rob's points with regard to recruitment and to retention as well. But one of the things, one of the big things that I have heard from family doctors who are interested, they may be in residency presently, uh, they may be from outside of the province, but one of the big things that they really want to see is a electronic medical record system. Uh, second, would be that collaborative approach, that collaborative practice. Uh, the last comment I'd make on that is going back to both uh, Mark and Debris and what I have said before is the social determinants of health and having departments not working in silos. Uh, think back uh, to uh, uh, April of 2019 and subsequent to that, it was one of the things in being from the community, but I hadn't heard it. There was no housing officer in West Prince. So anybody that was looking for housing, whether it was getting information with regard to uh, programming, uh, rent supplements and the like, there was no housing officer for them to actually approach. And, you know, that has been uh, addressed. But also, to have that individual in the West Prince area, and I'll just use that as a geographic example, but to have that individual in the West Prince area and to have the knowledge of our primary care providers that there is this individual. So if, uh, uh, again, going back to social determinants of health, if somebody is in a position that their housing is not adequate, uh, you know, whether it's because it's too small for family size, things along that line, that then the primary care provider knows that the individual from this other department, from another department, is there to be able to work with them. And to me, that's what it's all about, is working together. I've said it before, the importance of partnerships. Thank you, Thank Chairman. You. So we're under, we're, we're all right for 10 minutes. 10 minutes, we're out of here, we're doing this. Um, there's uh, three more, uh, Sydney will have some, uh, I'll just go to Trish and then maybe Sydney after that. We're so we're trying to keep things tight and out of here, Trish. Thank you, Chair. So, um, so just a, a comment and then a, and then a question. Um, so, just touching on the uh, new mental health campus and some of the discussion around this, I think it is it is very encouraging to hear that there will be increased uh, focus and understanding on the need to more effectively integrate with community services, most certainly, um, and build on those resources. It is true that yes, not everybody in a, inpatient care would need that if we had the appropriate services in the community. It's also true that there are islanders who really do need that inpatient care, whether it's uh, long-term or short-term, and it is critical that we do not forget about those islanders. Um, that mental, the, the mental health hospital, it, it's still a needed resource. Um, it's going to look different than what we have currently. That's not a bad thing, but it, it still needs to move forward, and uh, it is 
it's concerning to hear that the timelines on that are still seem to be very far out. Um, my question, though, is about the mobile integrated health um, program and the expansion of those services. So one of the things that, you know, I've been trying to actually get, and I've, I've asked uh, for this about six months ago, is the evaluation of the mobile integrated health program. Um, so if you're choosing to expand a service, I'm assuming that you have, uh, you know, information through a robust evaluation that shows that that is uh, an effective service and uh, exactly why it would be a good thing to expand. So just a few things to note. Um, you know, I always uh, do get a little cautious when we're providing or opening a new service that is uh, from a private, uh, a privatized uh, company. Um, so if the reasons for that need to be very clear why you're making that choice. Um, as well, we've heard that uh, recently that, you know, paramedics are, are not an endless supply. Um, we, we can't just keep adding on, adding on services to, um, to our, to Medibee, to <clears throat> our paramedics and expect that there is not going to be an impact on other services that paramedics absolutely critically need to provide, um, such as, you know, ambulance uh, services. So, you know, have you looked at the impact that it's going to have on our existing number of paramedics? And, um, you know, what are you going to do to address the shortages in, in that area then if you're going to expand those Great. services? Quick answers. So, Sorry. <laughs> I try to, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, with mobile integrated health and, and yes, so I don't have it with me, but there was an evaluation um, done. Um, and I know <clears throat> some of the comments from that uh, evaluation, when you think about the seniors wellness checks and uh, paramedics providing palliative um, care, um, very, very positive. And looking at the paramedics providing palliative care uh, at home, uh, it actually um, re reduced the number of transfers to hospital um, uh, as a result of that program. And uh, also when we talk to Islanders about many of our, our initiatives, whether it's um, primary care, seniors care, uh, they told us um, that they had positive experiences with mobile integrated health and would like actually to see more mobile integrated um, health in their in their communities and be able to um, uh, for us to ex expand that service um, and so regarding the privatization so there are many um, services uh, health services offered uh, in the province um, by private providers so for example our long-term private nursing homes and community care uh, facilities while they're operated privately um, the province uh, funds part or or all in some in some cases and so with the province and with the department being um, the accountable for that service uh, for being uh, the funder uh, we we manage we manage those files so I think it's an extension while well, health PI is the major uh, delivery of health care services in the province they're not the only um, services um, that Islanders access for their health care. So they've been accessing ambulances for, uh, ambulance services as an example for, for a long time. So I, I, don't, I don't think that I'm concerned about us retaining others to um, deliver services on our behalf, especially when um, we talked earlier about recruitment and retention and uh, the need to grow our capacity. So it's another, another way to deliver services that complement uh, what we are currently able to provide. So we, that's sort of how I would frame that one. I am aware um, that paramedics, um, they have been, over the last year and a half, um, through the pandemic, they have uh, demonstrated incredible adaptability, uh, uh, let's say flexibility, um, and have been pulled in many directions to um, better need, meet the needs <coughs> of the islanders and, you know, doing swabbing, uh, testing, uh, clinics, et cetera. Um, and so they've provided a very valuable service for us, and I know um, that they have um, they have expressed to us as well that there's only there are only so many parents so, you know, I think we do have um, a paramedic program both at um, Holland College as well as a bachelor's program now at UPEI. So we need to start working uh, more closely with those institutes of higher learning and to see how we can uh, uh, d develop um, more paramedics uh, for, for the province. Uh, working very closely with um, Island EMS and, and Medivy, the, the um, 
subsidiary uh, sub 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 of Medivy, um, in, in having these conversations about how we how we do expand uh, the workforce uh, for paramedics. So I'm very aware of it, um, and it's important, and we need to uh, ensure we don't burn our paramedics out. Sydney. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate the conversation about the electronic uh, medical records and uh, Minister you had mentioned about the, the things we keep hearing over and over from uh, recruitment and retention too about you know the, the collaborative team approach that, that physicians are looking for or all health professionals the quality of life here that, that we do have and then of course an a, a electronic medical record system in place too. Can you give us some more detail on that like you know where is it at? Who's using it now? How flexible are we with like reviewing it after it, it, it goes in in certain places? Just give us a bit of a sense. We know the long history we have with it, and, and uh, I don't want to dwell on that. It's it's exciting that we're we're getting there. So just give us a more detail around that. Specifically with regard to EMRs. Yes. Yeah. Uh, with that, uh, to, to go back not a long distance, but. Uh, a uh, contract was signed and it was uh, with TELUS Health that actually is going to be providing uh, the software, hardware for the rollout of this. Uh, as uh, was uh, reviewed there, I do believe in one of the slides, that uh, it will be July of this year that the first rollouts will take place in certain areas uh, with certain practices. I think uh, as we move forward, uh, from July into uh, the fall that uh, and when I say fall hopefully into September October that uh, the system will be in place right across the board uh, I don't know Mark Deborah if you have anything to add to that yeah I think the final rollout with sort of all the integration and all of that is sort of March 2022 like next March um, so yeah so that we're sort of on track for that we've had great uptake physicians have already uh, have indicated that some of the FIFA service physicians that are that uh, have a choice in this, I guess, that they, they've they're signing on to this. So uh, we're really pleased with where it's at. There's been um, the product that we purchased. I think has been well received, and, and physicians uh, of the whole are, are quite pleased with this. So it's it's. Um, <clears throat> we'll just go back to Sydney. I guess elaborate more on that. Like you know, um, you know, I, I've heard the health department say before that people are very pleased with it. And it has been so. Like you. Know, Make me feel even stronger that that we've got the right product, or that, or that we we can be flexible once things start rolling out that we can adjust it for the physicians too, right? Because I mean that's exciting, like you know, to hear the fee physicians that have the choice are actually you know coming on board with it. That's that's a good sign, kind of thing. But, Absolutely. You know. And so um, we we did go through sort of a rigorous sort of RFP piece. Um, we've done a lot of. Um, consultation with with our physicians dr. Christy Newson uh, sort of our medical EMR advisor has been uh, instrumental in a lot of that I would say that <clears throat> and then from the system itself it, it can be configured to the physician or the clinics sort of needs as well so there's it can be intuitive it has other other ways that they can um, set it up in, in, in easy ways it's, it's, it's actually um, it's really neat and really neat tool and, and so tell us has just purchased a uh, has taken over one of the one of the other ones that we were really considering and we're quite excited about, and so we're sort of getting the best of both worlds here, and so I think physicians see that, and uh, its ease of use is, is is high, like they find it's quite easy to use. Um, again, it's intuitive, it's it's easy to find information, um, so I think that people as a whole are are quite pleased with it. We have um, good supports in place around at the elbow training onboarding and all of those things as well so we're, we're really putting a, a full program together and really beyond the the technology we are putting a full program in terms of how do we really understand what's happening in primary care how can we better deliver services are we actually taking care of our uh, others with chronic illness to the level that we need to how can we have the system help support the clinicians in, in um, providing the, the right care so I think it's you know, everyone sees this as a real a real strength and um, there's been really little to no criticism, I don't think, about it so far. So, do you have a comment or follow up? Or I have any? one more question. Yeah, okay. sure. Um, it, and it goes back <clears throat> to the presentation from Dr. Garin, which you have seen. It's, it's, uh, it's good that the communication is happening every week between the, the three, the CEO and the board, or sorry, CEO and, and Health PI and the Department of Health, too. Dr. Garin was, was fairly adamant about, you know, like uh, he was even asked about the future and that kind of thing. Um, about you know needing the support from the 
the you know the, the provincial side of things uh, to make some of the tough changes to do some of these hard decisions it was pretty obvious do we feel that the Department of Health is going to be there to support health PEI in making those some of them tough decisions some of them just you know acting on things like you you heard the I don't want to say angst, but the you know in his voice to make these things happen. Do we have the support from the Department of Health to support Health PEI? We do. I think that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Minister. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's one of the things in, uh, that has been made clear by myself, and uh, that I've uh, reiterated before uh, how beneficial it's been for me to have those uh, regular meetings and the weekly calls with uh, CMO and the CEO. Uh, and it's been put out there by myself uh, directly to the CEO. What supports do you need? How can we help? How can we work together? Because to me, that's what it's all about. We have to work together. We can't, it can't be this, it has to be this. And uh, yeah, that uh, the supports will be there. Uh, there's always tough decisions to be made uh, in any government department, but certainly within the Department of Health and Wellness. Uh, and uh, those decisions uh, that will be made as well. When I say soft de tough decisions within uh, H&W, there's a lot of tough decisions that are made every day, but certainly at a higher level, uh, at health, uh, health PEI with regard to how certain programs are going to be delivered. And that's where it comes back to me of the importance of that communication, to be aware of what is going on, not to interfere, but to be aware of it, and to be able to, when needed, provide that support. So, thanks. Uh, Rob Henderson, then Lynn, and then we're... Uh, thanks. Uh, Minister, uh, your answers have somewhat a segue into my question here, actually. Uh, the, they're in the presentation that the Nurses' Union put forward. She, they had mentioned that there were numerous uh, unsafe protocols that were put in place because staffing was working over their uh, a lot of uh, times and not having the breaks, and there were certainly circumstances that I'm aware of where staff uh, just weren't, weren't in attendance or there, and they still had a... The facility still oper was operational, like long-term care facilities and things like that. So you've been a minister now for about six months, uh, and, and if you're having good communication, uh, how many situations or times did uh, unsafe protocols happen in our health care system uh, in the last six months? Uh, exact numbers, Rob, I couldn't give you right here. Uh, certainly, I don't know Mark or Lori Debra, but uh, what we can do is endeavor to bring that information back for the committee. But wouldn't that be something if you're in communication with the CEO quite regularly, you'd kind of know that answer? Because that's rather a serious situation, and there's serious liability issues that could occur when you get into those situations. We've seen the situations in Ontario with long-term care facilities when uh, staffing compliments weren't <laughs> appropriate. I'd have to say uh, on that, uh, and I, I'm glad that you brought it up, Rob, like you look at other jurisdictions, what they uh, experienced in their long-term care facilities, especially in the first and second wave, uh, because of uh, the direction that has been provided and the very good direction that has been provided, protocols by CPHO that were put in place right across uh, our long-term care facilities and our community care facilities as well that were adhered to. Uh, you know, we did not find ourselves in the position that other provinces, really every other province across the country found themselves in. Uh, did it, cr it created uh, challenges without a doubt with regard to staffing because of the fact that staff originally prior to uh, the vaccination could not move from one facility to another. And I think that we saw that not only in public uh, facilities but certainly in the private sector as well because you did have uh, workers that worked a certain number of hours at one location a certain number of hours at another location. So it, uh, it did create challenges without a doubt. And uh, once again, I just have to give a tremendous shout out to our frontline workers, whether it was in our acute care facilities, long-term care facilities, uh, you know, the redeployment that was required 
at times for vaccination, for uh, testing and the like. Uh, it all had an impact. But again, uh, Rob, with regard to your request, uh, certainly endeavor to get the exact well, information and get that back to you. Minister, for six months into this, and uh, we know that the, the challenges that, the, uh, you know, we, you stated in your, in your presentation that we're pandemic tested now. I would think we would know how many unsafe protocols have occurred in the last, say, six months. I'm not trying to go back to the 15 months. You had a, and, and, uh, and certainly the, the nurses' union mentioned that there was a lot not even uh, reported, but let's go with what has been reported. And it would be interesting information, I guess, to see how, how the system has gone through this in the last six months and is it back up and running, or are we, you know, obviously the protocols for the pandemic are still in existence. We still seem to be in a pandemic, uh, and uh, our system can't seem to handle any. That's why our protocols are still as strict and rigid as they are. So that, that's why I wanted to make that comment and try to get a handle on that. And I would have thought, as Minister, you probably would have known that with the communication you're having with the CEO and the Chief Public Health Officer. That, that's it. We'll go to Lynn, and uh, we'll just get towards the end here. Go. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to acknowledge, Chair, that you've done a really good job of trying to make space for everyone to answer questions, and I appreciate that. But the root cause of why you're having to navigate this is the presentation that you came prepared with filled half of the committee meeting. You only got through two of the four topics that you came prepared to speak on, and the Chair had to ask you to park two of them so that there would be time for questions. I would say that the presentation itself was thin on some of the details and the committee questions have been a much better conversation and dialogue back and forth, but I don't think I've ever seen a presentation that knowingly left so little time for that discussion to take place. I find that really concerning, Minister, I'm just going to say, I will get to my question quickly because I know we're already 15 minutes over time, but this is not a great approach for a committee meeting. I'm not a regular member, but I'll leave it at that. The issue of retention is a huge issue that is coming up a lot for me in my district, as I'm sure you can imagine, as we are hearing of doctors leaving, of uh, people leaving the PCH. This is a, a huge problem. And I came to this meeting to hear about your strategy on retention and recruitment. The retention side, again, as I've said, you came with no numbers on how many people have left no information on any of this, but instead a 45 minute introduction. I'm not left with any confidence that we are getting a lot of information from exit surveys. It sounds like you have very little information from exit surveys. It sounds like that information hasn't been provided to the minister. I, the people in my district want to know that we have an understanding of what is going wrong on why we're losing doctors and that we are addressing it and after the presentation we've had thus far, I don't feel like I can go back to my district and say I feel like that's being worked on. So I'm definitely hoping this committee is going to get a fulsome understanding of the exit surveys in the future, if not in the retention discussion. Then also I would like to know if when people are moving around within health PEI, not leaving necessarily entirely, but leaving their position, are we performing exit surveys with them? I, I don't understand where you are collecting great amounts of data on what the challenges are so that we can address them. Mm. Minister? Okay. Well, thank you, and I thank you, Lynn, for your comments. I think uh, you look at, uh, uh, at uh, the presentations, uh, presentation that was made here today. Uh, it shows the importance, the tremendous importance of health care right across uh, the province, of the different aspects of it. That, uh, yes, we as, I as minister, certainly, with staff, are more than, uh, more than happy uh, to come back to have further discussion, not only on uh, the two additional items, but if you want to revert back and have uh, questions uh, on uh, the presentation that was made here today, I think that it's paramount of paramount importance when we are asked to appear, when I as minister, together with my staff, are asked to appear before committee to provide as much information as possible. <coughs> and now the discussion that has taken place subsequent to that, 
you know, and I do appreciate the questions, uh, the comments that have been brought forward. Um, and yes, to be able to go back to get that information, to make sure that information uh, is, if it's available, is provided back to the committee. But uh, Chair, uh, I agree 100%. You have done one fantastic top shelf job here today. But I'm not. I'm not going to make any apology for the length of the presentation. Once again, we're more than happy to come back, myself as minister, with staff, to provide additional information and to work through the balance of, uh, of the presentation, uh, Chair. And uh, with that, I just want to, once again, uh, I look forward to appearing again. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to appear before a committee. Uh, I would have to reiterate that it, with the discussion, with the information that has been provided, that it does show the importance, the commitment that I as minister, that my staff do have. And I know right across the board, uh, all MLAs, everyone representing Islanders in this legislative assembly mm -hmm. have that same commitment. And uh, just to reiterate again that, yes, there's been successes and that there are challenges. I think going ahead too, one of the things that uh, the discussion, and I guess it's a follow-up to some of the points that were made here previously today with retention, exit surveys, things along that line, but also to get uh, a handle as we move forward on what the human resource requirements are going to be across government, but certainly within the Department of Health and Wellness, with regard to identifying where those gaps may be so that we know uh, doctors or doctors X and Y are leaving at a certain time so that we're prepared in advance as much as possible. Mm -hmm to address that situation. And I just use doctors as an example. It could be nurses, it could be uh, physiotherapists, what have you. Mm -hmm. But we have to do a better job of that. And again, thank you for the invitation. and do look forward to uh, appearing again. Th thank Thanks. you very much, Minister. And uh, and I will, um, I'll say that th this this process today was long. Our health care system is, we, we need to look at our health care system. I think this was a good democratic process, which we got somewhere. I mean, the great questions about the committee, and it was a it was a wholesome debate, and, and it's great to know that you'll come back to speak to important issues, and maybe we should do this more often, and, and then we get somewhere for Islanders. Um, uh, I don't have any questions. I just want to make sure that the clerk knows that... Uh, Michelle Beaton had asked for a table document, so just let the record reflect that. Uh, I Michelle? I have a second request, actually. Second request? Second request. Okay. Um, the evaluation report for the mobile integrated health care system, so, and can we have that immediately prior to it being launched? Because I, I guess you're rolling it out across the province in July. I believe that there was one done for Western Hospital that we've been asking for in our office for several months. Okay. So if we could get access to that evaluation report, that would be great. And sure. Thank you. I've noted it. I've noted it. And, be, it. Be, and what I'll do is allow the committee members to ask further questions in, in a written format, potentially, if that's okay, with the department, because um, it was not a lot. Of, we didn't really have as much time as we wanted on important topics, so I'll ask them so you might get some, some requests for additional questions. Um, I will I will say that this concludes our meeting, and I, I thank the presenters to come and I thank the committee for, for bearing with a long, important meeting today, and I think this was a good process, again, for democracy and, and health care in our province. So um, can I, would, would there, is there any new business for this morning? Uh, no, new, no new business? Okay, we'll pass over that. Can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? Uh, Carla Bernard, this meeting's adjourned. Thank you.